73, The Angakok from Kakertok. A Tale from South Greenland An Angakok, who used to have his winter station a little north of Kakertok, Julianhab, took a fancy to go and discover a nice and delightful country. And starting for his journey, he came to Nook, Godthab. He had a daughter called Kakamak, and a son besides. From Nook they went farther on to Pasugfik, and met another Angakok, named Kajernek, who was the only person that had been far to the north. On being questioned concerning these parts, he answered, Indeed all the country northwards is very fine, but no other part of it can be compared with Alulasat, Jakobshavn. On hearing this, the Southlander at once started, and after a long journey at length landed on the coast at Alulasat, when the earth was already becoming hard with frost, in consequence of which they had great trouble in getting their house built. And being hardly able to manage the frozen turf, they made their house very small. During their stay at this place, a fine young man courted Kakamak, without the knowledge of her parents. Her brother's wife was a very modest and timid person. But Kakamak, on the contrary, was proud and presumptuous, and often abused her sister-in-law, who, however, did not mind her scolding, and her parents likewise let her have her own way, and never interfered. But one day another woman of the place told Kakamak's mother that her daughter was secretly married to the young man, the mother told it to her husband when they had gone to rest in the evening. On this the Angakok at once had his boat put out, and everything prepared for departing, and when so far ready, he ordered his daughter into the boat. People thought that he was only going on some excursion, but in reality he was quite resolved on going back to the south. The young man now stepped forward, saying, Kakamak is mine, and I want her. But her father replied, No man shall ever have my daughter, and if any one should dare to take her by force, I shall be sure to fetch her back. So saying, he pushed from land. And travelling on incessantly, they at length came to a little island called Alangok, where, for the first time, they pitched their tent. In this place Kakamak secretly gave birth to a child, which she afterwards killed. Proceeding further, they came to a place just opposite Nook, where they built their house for the coming winter. In his excursions here the Angakok used to meet with a little manly kayaker, to whom he proposed to marry Kakamak. The other answered, I am willing enough, but the women are always telling me that I am dark-skinned. The Angakok did not mind that the least, but led him home to his daughter, saying, Thou art a vain and frivolous girl, and thou hast great need of a good provider and husband, and such a one I have brought thee now. Kakamak made no reply to this, but did not reject him, and so he became her husband. One day he returned, bringing home three seals. But when he went to sit down beside her, without offering her any tobacco, she pushed him away, so that he fell down on the floor, rising quickly, he took his seat on the side ledge. Kakamak was exceedingly fond of snuff. And when he came to know of her inclination, he sometimes brought his goods to Nook to barter them for tobacco. Subsequently Kakamak got a son, whereat the grandfather rejoiced extremely. But one day, when the little one was running about and playing on the floor, he suddenly gave a loud shriek, the blood gushed out of his mouth and nostrils, and he was soon dead. They had another son, who died about the same age, and in the same manner, and when the same misfortune befell a third, the Angakok tried a conjuration. Not being able to find out anything about it, he said, perhaps we are too near akin, let Kajernek be called, and they at once started with a boat for him. In the evening, when the conjuration was performed, he said, when the children died the sister-in-law of Kakamak always reproached her as being guilty of a crime, and having an Angiak, ghost of a child, who had killed the children. The sister-in-law did not utter a word in reply. Continuing his conjurations, he farther pronounced, I see a kayak approaching from the north, it has the shape of a dog's head, it draws nigh. Now it is in the doorway, but it cannot get through the inner entrance. The Angakok now asked, Who was thy sack? P, in the Angakok language the same as mother. All listening in silence, they heard an infant's voice replying, Kakamak. Where is thy home? I was born on the island of Alangok, it is I who have caused the death of all my younger brothers. Kajuranek ordered the Angiak to pass the threshold. 
It was very long in doing so. But having at length entered, he pursued it, hoping to get it destroyed. It was now seen also by the other Angakok, but slipped away through a hole near one of the roof beams. Kajuranek said, it is difficult to get it, because it has already killed several individuals. The conjurations having terminated, they found Kakamak sitting coiled up in the farthest corner of the ledge all tears. Seeing her thus, the sister-in-law, mindful of all the bad language she had to put up with from Kakamak, took to rebuking and scolding her in turn. The following day Kajuranek tried to catch hold of the Angiak, but in vain. It made its escape through a small opening just as the day before, in consequence of which he was obliged to give it up. Kakamak now grew meek and more submissive. But her father, being greatly depressed in spirits, determined to leave for another place, and choosing Nyakunganak, they went to settle there along with another family, consisting of many brothers. Towards winter they all joined company, went out deer hunting, and killed a great many animals with bows and arrows, but his son having the greatest luck in shooting, the others got envious and killed him out of jealousy. The Angakok took the loss of his son so much to heart, that he at once returned to Nook, where he remained till the day of his death. 74. Yudaritsak's Journey to the Far North A Tale from South Greenland A man, named Yudaritsak, once started from Alolasat, and traveled northwards, visiting all the inhabited places he passed. He went beyond Umanak and even Upernivik, and at last came to people who had no wood for tent poles, and merely placed the stiff dried seal skins upon end, so as to form a tent, in which they slept on the bare ground. The first morning after their arrival, Yudaritsak was standing quite unconsciously, his arms drawn out of his sleeves, when, all of a sudden, he felt someone giving him a heavy push from behind. But without hesitation he turned round and dealt the offender such a blow that he rolled along the ground, and then went off without saying a word. When this had been twice repeated, the inhabitants learned to fear him, and he was left in peace. In this place they noticed that the infants had all holes in the hoods of their jackets. Having got more familiar with the parents, they asked them about these holes, and pointing to the moon, they answered, it is because he on high has been gazing at them. Whomsoever he deigns to look down on is always sure to get holes in his garments. When Yudaritsak got weary of his stay there, he traveled still farther north, following the margin of the solid ice. All along the coast there were abundance of white whales. Unable to get on shore, they pitched their tents upon the ice, sometimes spreading the skin of a white whale, without removing the blubber, as a flooring on the ground to sleep upon, and always leaving it behind on starting. At length they approached a very steep and craggy coast, and near the only place where landing was practicable they found a little house, but no people. On entering it, Yudaritsak at once perceived that the ceiling beams were made out of narwhal's horn, and not a bit of wood was seen anywhere. They likewise found a head of strange appearance, consisting of tallow only, and instruments whose points were carefully wrapped up in tallow and skin. Seeing no people whatever, they began to feel uneasy, and soon left again. They managed the same way on their homeward journey, and settled for the winter at a place where the people were excellent ball players. In the middle of winter they made an immense ball, by stuffing out an entire seal skin with sand and various other heavy things, and finally making their old crones sit down upon it and enchant it by magic spells. On coming to the play they wore their usual dress, excepting on the feet, which they had only clothed in stockings with new soles. The ball was brought out on the ice upon a sledge, and the counterparty was stationed nearer the shore. They continued playing and pushing one another until the winner succeeded in striking the ball ashore and right through the window of their house. Then it was seized on by an old hag, who seated herself upon it. Afterwards the victorious party gave a succession of entertainments, and the general amusement continued during all the season of the increasing daylight. In spring Yudaritsak returned to Alolasat. There he met with a man called Kapixwak, from Kangamiat, South Greenland, and it was he to whom he told his adventures in the north. During Cape Igswak's stay two sledgers also arrived from the north, who stated that they had left their faraway home at the time of full moon, and who had arrived here just at the next full moon. 
These visitors were total strangers to the inhabitants, and were from head to feet clothed in suits made of reindeer skin. They reported that in their home the reindeers might be seen lying close to the houses, and on the tops of the roofs, like dogs in other places. Their object in this long journey, they said, was to barter with the Europeans for firearms, with which view they had brought fox and reindeer skins. The merchant wanted also to buy their dogs, and made a handsome bid for them, offering a tin box of powder, and a whole barrel of lead for balls, in exchange for them. The strangers, however, answered that they could not spare them. In the spring Capixwak returned to Kangamiat, while Yitaritsak started for another trip to the far north to revisit the house with beams of narwhal horn. This time he intended to land at a little distance and approach it cautiously from the land side, in order to find out whether it was occupied, and if so, he wanted to see what the people were like. When Capixwak had been staying for some time at Kangamiat, he planned a journey southwards, and went to Kakertok. During his stay there a man named Sakak captured a Kayapakak, fin whale, Balanoptera boops. Sakak had four wives, of which the last, Igpak, was very haughty, and greedy besides. When the news of the Kayapakak was spread many visitors came, but Igpak had nothing to spare for the guests. Sakak himself invited an old man to his house, but when he was fairly seated Igpak rudely exclaimed, Why, really? we have no lack of old men looking in upon us this time. The old man retorted, for my part one only came because I was asked. On this reply she gave him a piece of matak, and likewise a knife for cutting it, the latter, however, he rejected, saying he only wanted to take it home with him. Igpak, who was always eating as if she could never be satisfied, after a while went on in this style, what ails me? What is becoming of me? I left my work undone because of the vittles, that always seemed to be drawing me on. However, she did not give over, but ate all the more, till her tongue at length was so sore that it turned quite awry, and crying out, Sakak, my tongue. I am growing matak myself, she suddenly died. People say that while she lived a noxious whale monster used to appear above the water whenever she left the house, but after her death it was seen no more. The principal wife being gone, the others were now at liberty to share out as they liked. In the following spring Capixwak returned to Kangamiat. He was afterwards baptized and called Ejid. He is buried at Kangamiat. 75. Savangwak. A story from South Greenland. Near Kangadlugswatsiak there lived a man called Numak, with his wife Kajapigak. Both were very anxious to get a suitable wife for their only son. Numak, from his early youth, had neither fancied nor taken any part in singing or dancing entertainments. At the dancing parties he would turn away from the performers, seeming to take no notice of them. But if a wrestling match or a trial of strength was going to come off, he was always on the alert. At last Numak fixed upon a girl named Savangwak for the wife of his son, and he became very fond of his daughter-in-law. In summertime he had one day gone out kayaking by himself, and on landing from a hill perceived a ship approaching. He lost no time in getting out his kayak, and rowed away to meet it. Having got alongside the vessel, he saw a rope ladder hanging down the side, but not a single man was seen on deck, and no one answering his repeated calls, he went on board and entered the cabin. All was desolate there as elsewhere, and he concluded that the crew had recently left the ship, omitting to furl the sails. The ship having run in among the islands and grounded, he left it to fetch a boat. Returning with this, he established himself and his people on board, and they soon ascertained that the cargo was in no way injured. In the cabin they found beads like those they had been accustomed to get from the whalers, and having possessed themselves of them, they thought themselves very rich. They also overhauled the cargo, but being totally unacquainted with it, they poured into the sea such articles as peas, sugar, and molasses. Having taken from the ship all they could lay hands on, they tore down the sails in order to make use of them as an outside cover of their tents. All the finest beads were given to Savangwak. Afterwards, when Savangwak had already got several children, some Southlanders arrived, whom Numak invited to come and stay at his house. In the beginning of winter the younger baby of Savangwak died, 
and they were all very sorry. One day, when her husband was absent, a vile old crone belonging to the Southlanders went on mocking the bereaved mother, holding up her own grandchild before her in a provoking manner unobserved by the others. This roused Savangwak's suspicion against her. On the same day her husband was expected back, her mother-in-law brought all the reindeer skins in, to have them looked over. While everyone's attention was taken up with this, Savangwak ran outside to take the air. On finding she did not return, Kajapagak turned to some of the larger children and said, Go and look after your sister-in-law. They soon came back saying, She is standing outside the house. As she still remained out, they all ran off to fetch her back. Following her tracks, they had to cross a hill, and at length found her at the bottom of a little lake close by. Nobody was able to draw her out, but at the same time they perceived Numak in his kayak making for the shore. No one, however, dared to call him and tell him what had happened, but getting suspicious from their silence, he put in at once, and hurried to them. On looking round for information, one of the bystanders screamed out, Thy daughter-in-law is lying dead at the bottom of the lake. Without uttering a single word, he proceeded to draw her out, and tried every means for reviving her. But these proving all in vain, he let the others bring her to the house. On carrying her in, they brought all their things out according to custom. The husband of the deceased, who was named Tatarak, also arrived, calling out that he had got a white whale. The servant maid of the house silently went down to receive and help him. Feeling assured that something was amiss, he asked her to draw his kayak on shore. Obeying her master she pulled up the boat, but did it hurriedly without the usual care, at which he looked inquiringly at her, but got no answer. On stepping ashore his father met him and gave him the sad intelligence that his wife had drowned herself. Without undressing he quickly entered the house, and the father as well as the son went up and down the room deliberating upon how to find out the cause of her death. Meanwhile some of the others were whispering, now we will soon have done with the old hag, but the two men never heard them. And unable to discover any reason, they broke out into loud lamentations, joined by all the rest, the old hag only excepted, who was busy eating matak. Some time after, a baby of the place was called Savangwak in memory of the deceased. And it happened that one of Numak's housefellows told him that the old woman had been heard to mock and ridicule the baby's namesake. When the little one was learning to walk, the old hag one day took to scolding it. On hearing which, Numak and his son rose up together, saying, Now we see who is the real culprit, and so saying, he poured out a pailful of icy water upon the naked woman, afterwards throwing the pail out of the window. Her companions quietly kept their seats in a row on the ledge, but they were soon upset by Numak, who tore away the ledge boards beneath them, which were likewise thrown outside, and he removed all his belongings out of the house. They departed from thence to Kasijasat, leaving their wicked housefellows behind. During their stay at Kasijasat several other people came to encamp there, waiting for the migratory seal. About that time Habakkuk, forty-five a youth whose parents had likewise pitched their tents there, one day kayaked northwards to meet the seals, and was suddenly surprised on seeing a boat coming down upon him, rowed by a single man. Habakkuk, on his part, made up to them, and rowed on alongside of them, being too modest to address them first. At last their old woman Ajigausak began, We are almost starving, give us a little of thy new-caught seal. We came away from Sakak, where all our housefellows died of famine, and we have travelled all this way south without once taking our boat ashore for drying, our only provisions have been half-dried boat skins. When she had ended, Habakkuk went closer to them, saying, Well, take the skin of my seal with blubber and all, and the liver besides. They forthwith tried to get the animal out of the boat, but were too weak and exhausted to do it without his help. Their old woman proceeded to cut it up, and gave each a little piece of the blubber, and having their hunger appeased for the present, they followed him home, where a meal was instantly set before them. However, they were at first only able to take a very little food, and then went off to sleep, having first asked their old woman to light a lamp. She trimmed it with blubber, accordingly. But missing the stick to stir it up with, she had to make a shift with her forefinger, at the same time exclaiming, what a length of time I have longed for the sight of this. 
However, the strange travelers began to recover by the nourishing food they were getting, but still they often fell asleep in the midst of their meal. On awaking, however, they fell to again, and at last grew so fat that they could hardly get on their boots. Soon afterwards they prepared to leave, intending to go still further to the south. 76. Inurutlagak, whose Christian name was Peter Ranthole. A tale from North Greenland. In times far back, the ancestors of this same Inurutlagak, viz. Fabulous dwarf islander or mountain elf, are said to have lived at the southernmost point of the country, at a place called Kutserfik, and this was before they had learned to be shy of human beings. Just about that time a lasting enmity sprang up between them on account of an Inurutlagak being killed by a man. And ever after, they say that the gnomes have resorted to desert places, making hollows in the earth for their abodes, and shunning the society of man. Thirsting for vengeance, they in return kill the man whom they chanced to meet with on one of their excursions. Being sadly in want of proper arms, they found a large willow bush on the sunny side of the Kutserfik Mount. Its form was like a man bending down on his knees and supporting his hand against the ground. From one of its roots they made a weapon not larger in size than a closed fist, shaped like a pistol. And at the end they put a little black stone, with a little red one on the top of it. This instrument, when finished, they named the pointing weapon. Knowing and fearing its killing powers for their own kith and kin, they are said always to have carried it in their hand. At this time the Inurutlagak of our tale was born. His father's name was Malurki, that of the eldest son Kinavina. Of the second, Kuk, of the third, Asarf, and of the fourth, Sersak, of whom we are going to tell. Being given to moving about, his parents and relatives set out on a journey to the north, and traveled on for several years successively, always passing the winter in hollows in the earth, and starting again in the early spring. It is told that they once met with some singular people, whose upper limbs were those of human beings, but below the waist they were shaped like dogs. These creatures were armed with bows, and dreadful to behold, and could catch the scent of man and beast against the wind like animals. One winter they covered the whole inside of their abode underground with a single skin, that of the large beast called Kilifak, the one with six legs. The story goes that when they had eaten the flesh of this animal, the bones were covered anew with flesh, but only up to the sixth time, and despite its strength and size, they killed it with the above-mentioned instrument, by merely pointing at it. They also knew how to diminish the distance from one place to another, by drawing the various parts of the country closer, and performed this by merely kneeling down together and spreading their arms out towards the mountaintops. But finding some of them too high to spread their arms over, the foremost crossed the already contracted parts with one long stride, the others one by one following in his tracks. Whenever one of them was unfortunate enough to make a false step, several of them were left far behind for a long time. After a journey of several years, they arrived at Ikarasarswak, at the mouth of Wygat Straits, a place where lived Inurutligax, as well as Inorisex. There they settled to wait till the frost should cover the ground with ice and make it possible to join those on the other side. Starting again in spring, and passing several winters at different places, they at length reached Nusak on the continent, and came to their long-wished for relatives, and there they lived for many winters. People say that at the beginning of the journey to the north the high mountains were still without ice, and Ikarasarswak without any glacier. These elves had two different ways of clothing themselves, one suit they had fitting their natural size, and the other was large enough to fit a man. During their wandering they wore their own proper clothes, carrying the large ones with them, ready to put on in case they should get some heavy load to carry. They could then, by beating themselves, reach human size. Their way of regaining their natural appearance was by bending down to enter their cave, and hitting the crown of their heads against the roof, on which they dwindled down to their ordinary smallness. An Angakok at Nusak, whose wife was childless, wanted to buy a child from the Inurutlagax, and offered to pay for him with three knives, a piece of bearskin, and some whalebones already twisted into fishing lines. Malurki, on seeing them, grew very desirous of these things, and having got them, he gave the knives to his three sons, but the fourth and youngest he sold in exchange for them. His new father brought him home, 
and went to hide him behind the house. At night, however, he got inside, and at once slipped into the womb of his mother, on which account it was said that he was in a state of perfect consciousness while he remained in his mother's womb. These elves were long in turning old. Their youth was renewed five times over. On getting old the first time, they let themselves fall headlong down a precipice, and in this way regained the vigor and elasticity of youth. After repeating this five succeeding times, it was useless to try a sixth. This practice of letting themselves fall down they called Inatsungnardic. They never die young, but only after having undergone their five separate ages, excepting those who are killed by snowslips. 77. The Kutak and Inwinak. Several brothers had an only sister, whom they loved dearly and were very loath to part with. To the north of them was another hamlet, where lived a Kutak and Inwinak. One day when out kayaking, a Kutak said, let us go and give the brothers yonder a call. Inwinak surmised they would only get a cold reception. However, they started, but not a man did they find at home. And the women of the place could not give them any welcome, their husbands having strictly ordered them not to receive any unmarried man whatever during their absence. The strangers nevertheless entered the house, where they found the lonely sister occupying a seat on the southern side of the ledge, where her bedding also could be seen most handsomely piled up. Though seats were offered to them at the northern end, they preferred a settle facing the unmarried sister. They now proceeded to relieve themselves of their jackets, a kutak displaying a skin as fair and soft as that of a white whale, while Inwinak on stripping himself came out as black as a raven. Thus they remained a short time. But before food had been offered to them, the men of the place were hailed returning with their prey. The women ran down to assist them in bringing up their seals. But no sooner had they re-entered the house than a voice was heard in the passage, and a man entered, and in a grumbling voice broke out, Well, to be sure, we are having visitors. This was the middle brother, and he was soon followed by the rest of them. Akutak answered, There thou art right, however, we were not very anxious to come at all. The middle brother then ordered some meat to be served up to them. And, after a plenteous feast, there was a good deal of talking, but the whole of the evening the visitors kept their seats, never turning their looks off the maiden sister. At length the brothers, longing for rest, lay down to sleep, reclining in their different places. Only the middlemost of them determined to keep watch, and, having pulled off his boots, leaned back, keeping an eye on the strangers all the while. Presently he heard Inwinak call out in a loud voice, Young girl, make up a bed for me. The sister at once complied, and he lay down beside her. The brothers first thought of interfering, but soon gave up the idea, and took no further notice of them. Akutak being now left by himself, was beginning to feel rather lonely. And, not addressing anyone in particular, simply cried out, Make up a bed for me, too. The brothers only glanced at him, saying, Why, thou art raving, just lie down by thyself. Somewhat abashed, he went off to sleep. But in the morning, when the others awoke, they found he was gone. In his anger he had bewitched the sister, in order to set her against her new husband. Early in the morning, the brothers all left in their kayaks, but the brother-in-law remained in bed till after sunrise, when he likewise started, having first put on his kayak jacket. Ere long it was announced that he was putting back, and had some spoil in tow. He had already captured two seals, and his young wife was soon on the alert for flensing and cutting them up. This done, she fell upon her husband's neck, caressing him incessantly, and would not leave him alone a single moment. When night set in, and the brothers had all returned, he actually began to be afraid of her, and removed to another corner of the room, where he seated himself behind a lamp, always keeping her off. But still she would not leave him at peace. And catching hold of him with one hand, she at last took up a piece of a grindstone with the other, eating away at it as if it had been a morsel of ice. At sight of this, the brothers exclaimed, Our sister has gone raving mad. Let us be off from here, and away they fled, having first cut asunder all the lashings of their boat, and at their departure, one of them said to their brother-in-law, If people are like this one, nothing is to be done. And thou hadst better come with us. 
But the other rejoined, I will take my chance, and stay, if it be only for this one night. The others all started off, while he remained with his wife. But she went on pursuing him all the night, and he kept running away from her, scarcely able to escape her clutch. At dawn of day, however, he succeeded in making a bold leap from the floor right down the house passage, and rushing along to seize his kayak, he quickly got into it. But at the very moment he was ready to push off, she again reached him, and made an attempt to catch hold of the kayak point, in which, however, she did not succeed. At first she seemed determined to follow him on the water, but all of a sudden she turned back. And having looked after her a little while, the poor husband hastened away to a small island off the coast, where he knew the brothers had established themselves. The middlemost came out, inquiring how she was. And being informed how she was, he remarked as before, if people are like her, there is nothing to be done but keep away from them. When ten days had elapsed, one morning the husband said, I must go and look after her. She may possibly be starving for want of food. The others tried to dissuade him, but he insisted on going. Having reached the place, he only pulled his kayak halfway out of the water, and then proceeded to the house. For fear of his wife, he did not venture to enter at once, but only peeped in at the window, and there he perceived her lying on the ledge, her hair all loose and disheveled. When he addressed her, she answered him back in the blandest manner, saying, I am quite well, come inside. He went in at her bidding. But no sooner had he entered the room than she jumped up, and made a furious rush at him, upon which he again started back, and narrowly escaped through the doorway. She quickly followed him, and after vainly attempting to catch the prow of his kayak, he suddenly observed her walking on the water as if it had been solid ice. Hearing her voice, he turned round, and seeing her close by he cried, Why did I go and see this wicked thing? Probably she is going to eat me up. As the only way to keep her off, he began swinging to and fro in his kayak. Presently her voice grew weak, and on turning round, he saw her nearly falling, but always giving her time to get up, he at last brought her towards the brothers. On seeing her approach, they cried, Why didst thou bring her over? She will kill us all. While they were thus exclaiming, and the husband could not persuade himself to leave her altogether, she saw before her a streak of little ripples on the water. And when she came to them, she suddenly turned, and went back wailing and lamenting. The husband now left off visiting her for a long time, but at last one day he said, I must go and see her once more, she is probably dead. On arriving at the place, he found the house empty, and at last discovered her sitting in a cave all shrunk together, and stone dead. Having buried her remains, and covered the grave well with stones, he returned. They now resolved upon giving up the house for good, and settled down for the coming winter on the outermost of the islets, soon after which the sea was frozen over. About this time a poor orphan boy, living in the house of Akutak, said to his housefellows, I am in great want of boots, and intend to go to the brothers and offer them my little dog in exchange for a pair of old boots. Accordingly he betook himself to their old place. On arriving there in the morning, he wondered at seeing the house without windows. However, he went up to it, and found it still well provisioned. But he could neither see a boat nor any person about the place. On entering, he found all the skin hangings of the walls torn down and spread on the floor. But knowing no other inhabited house in the neighborhood, he soon made up his mind to stay the night over, and at dark went to fetch some blubber, trimmed a lamp, and lighted it. He then pulled off his ragged boots, and having put them up above the lamp to dry, seated himself at the south end of the ledge. At first his little dog had followed him into the house, and rolled itself up at his feet on the floor. But while his boots were drying, the dog began to sniff and yell, and running outside, its barking gradually became more distant. Some time after, it again returned, and lying down before its master, looked at him very sharply, and then rushed out howling as before, this time re-entering immediately. The orphan thought, dogs are not unconscious of anything. He then put on his boots and rushed out, soon followed by the dog. Before they had made their way through the house passage, on looking out he caught sight of the ghost making towards him through the entrance, dragging its shroud behind it. 
the boy being in the middle part of the passage, pressed himself close up to the wall, and the dog also. At the very moment he expected to be discovered by the ghost, it passed by, on which the dog instantly jumped noiselessly out, followed by his poor master. Both now hastened down to the ice. But before they had got far, the spectre was seen emerging from the house in full pursuit of them. It did not, however, get hold of them, for at a little distance the fugitive had to pass by a large iceberg. And seeing a cave on one side of it, he stepped quickly in, and there awaited the coming day. At dawn he issued forth again, but did not know which way to wend his steps. His first plan was to go back to his own home when he suddenly espied a number of people on one of the outer islets. He at once turned towards them. They apparently got much excited at seeing him, thinking it might be the mad woman. Not till he was quite close did they recognize the poor orphan boy, when they all asked whether he had not slept in the haunted house, and whether he had seen anything amiss there. He answered, No, I observed nothing particular. And in so saying he told a lie, as he had barely escaped being devoured by the ghost. When they asked him why he had gone there at all, he made answer, because I wanted to barter away my little dog for a pair of boots. The middle brother now said, Well, thou art a hearty little fellow for thy age, and with these words he gave him two pairs of boots without taking his dog, and when the boy was about to leave, he asked a gift of a knife with a pretty handle. All the other brothers likewise loaded him with little presents of various kinds. On reaching home, however, he exchanged all these things for a kayak of his own. 78. Arnar Sarswaik, the Kivigtok Woman Arnar Sarswaik was a pretty girl, much courted by the best seal hunters of the neighborhood. Her brothers being unwilling to let her get married, she at length took up with a fellow and lived with him as his concubine. Before long she was with child, but notwithstanding, her brothers still continued loving her dearly. One day she had been out to fetch water, and at the very moment she was about to enter she chanced to hear her sisters-in-law within talking about her, saying to each other. I wonder whoever will care to be troubled with the charge of that wretch Arnar Sarswake is going to give birth to. On hearing these words, she at once put down her pails in the passage, and ran off far to the inland, away from humankind. During her flight she perceived that the time had come when she should be delivered. She fell into a deep swoon and on recovering found she had given birth to a King Gilrak.46 Formerly, in the days of her prosperity, she had been kind and charitable to two orphan children, a boy and a girl, who lived among them. Many years after, when Arnar Sarswake's brothers were all dead, the two orphans took up their abode at a solitary place out on some faraway islands. When the brother was following his trade in his kayak the sister felt miserably lonely. To make up for which, however, when he again returned she felt as if the house were full of visitors. One evening when they were sitting chatting together, the brother suddenly said, I think I shall try to recall the song that Arnar Sarswake used to sing. But the sister advised him rather to desist, saying, Remember that Arnar Sarswake now belongs to those of uncommon kind, having fled from mankind during her pregnancy. I have heard that such people have the gift of hearing their own songs a long way off. However, the brother would not give up his intention. But no sooner had he commenced singing than a voice was heard outside, on hearing my song I could not resist coming, and here I am. The brother and sister looked at each other in great alarm, knowing that their house was far away from any one. However, they soon recognized the voice to be Arnar Sarswake's, on which the sister resumed, Did not I tell thee she would be sure to hear thee singing? Now go and answer, thou being the best talker of us. The brother, however, did not stir. And the voice was again heard, Ye need not be afraid of me, I only want to get inside. Seeing her brother could find no words, the sister said, Well, come in. And presently a sound was heard of something creeping along the passage, while the two shrank back on the ledge in silence, with a sure foreboding that the next moment they would be frightened to death. The sound rapidly approached. They only ventured a timid glance towards the entrance, and immediately after Arnar Sarswake entered, prettier than ever, and said, I was lately far from this place, in the interior, whence I was suddenly lured by some voice calling me hither. The sister now took courage to say, 
it was only for a pastime he tried to sing thy lay. Arnar Sarswake continued, Ye know why I fled. It was because I heard my sisters-in-law observing that no one would be found willing to provide for my poor offspring. On that day I ran far off into the interior, when I was soon to give birth to a kingilrak, which ever since adhered to my body till a few days ago. In my present state ye have nothing to fear from me, and I would be very glad to come and stay with you. Seeing that they had no choice, and could not get rid of her, they allowed her room on the farthest end of the ledge, and themselves lay down, leaving a wide space between them, still they were quite unable to fall asleep. The following day the brother wanted to go out hunting, his sister, however, persuaded him to stay at home on account of her new housemate, whom they still considered rather a doubtful personage. On the ensuing day he went out kayaking, but kept so near to the house as not to lose sight of them for any length of time. In the evening, however, he returned, bringing with him two seals, and the sister at once ran down as usual to flents and cut up the animals, but Arnar Sarswake would not allow it, taking all the work on herself. And having quickly flensed both seals, she made up a fire, and while she did the cooking she sewed at the same time. As time went by, and their fears subsided, the brother resolved to marry her. But when she came to be pregnant the sister began to fear she would bear no human offspring, and in that case she said, Whither am I to flee? Seeing we live on an island, I can only rush down to the sea. When her time had come, the brother as well as the sister determined to run away from the house. But when the brother turned back to have a last look through the window, his wife turned towards him, saying, It is all over, and the birth has taken place. Do not fear, but come in to me. On hearing this he hastened to bring his sister back. When they returned, Arnar Sarswake sat smiling kinkly on them, and said, Behold the object of your fears, my two babes. She then showed them a little bear cub and a real child. Both were nursed together, and when the bear had begun to go about by himself she again bore a child and another little bear. In due time the father gave his boys kayaks, and the bears of their own account went out for provender. And at length the father could afford to take things easy, and rest from work. Subsequently he proposed that they should all set out together in search of other people, thinking that the children ought not to live always at such a desolate place. Accordingly they started northwards, the sons following in their kayaks, while the bears kept swimming alongside the boat. Travelling on thus, they at length came in sight of a well-peopled place. On this the bears stuck closer to the boat, and out of bashfulness only papped their muzzles above water. The father remarked, don't be ashamed, remember ye also are of human extraction. However, on landing a little south of the settlement they were received by a number of people, who on seeing two large bears ran off for their weapons. But on the father calling to them, what are you thinking of? They also are my children, they desisted. The newcomers took up their winter quarters at this place, where the sons both got married, and all lived happy tag ether. When the weather was too bad for the men to go out hunting, the bears went off in their stead. After wintering there they again broke up for their old home, and were joined by several people of the place, who accompanied them thither, where their bones now rest. 79. Avatarswak, who was baptized Nathan. It is said that his grandfather, being likewise called Avatarswak, was a wise man. It was he who took charge of his younger namesake, whose own father had been early called away from home. The grandfather admonished him not to harm the meanest dog, and never to be uncivil towards old people, not even on being reproved by them. When he came to possess a kayak of his own he remarked that his grandfather, when pushing him off the beach, was always heard to pronounce some strange words, at the same time uncovering his head by pulling the hood back behind the ears. But though the youth listened carefully, he could not make out the meaning of the words. About the time when he first commenced seal catching his grandfather died. And being left alone he took up his winter quarters at a place where the Southlanders had to pass by when on their trading excursions to the European settlement at Pamiot, Frederickshap. At length two kayakers on their voyage to this place passed by his residence, whom he expected for ever so long to see return, but in vain. At length he learned from the south that both were missing, and at the same time that he was suspected of having killed them. Some time after, 
being in want of a skin for a hunting bladder, he went off in search of a firth seal. It was fine weather, and so calm that the breathing of the larger seals was plainly audible. As for the small firth seals, however, he saw none, and was getting farther and farther into the bay. Suddenly something emerged from the water, coming up close behind him, and beating the top of his kayak, and lo! It was nothing less than a tupolak, monster made by sorcery. It accosted him, saying, How lucky I met thee thus alone, as I am longing for some entrails. Stupefied with awe, he felt the creature creeping up on the top of the kayak behind him, constantly repeating, I shall soon make a feast on thy entrails. At the same time pressing down the stern of the kayak so deep as to make the prow rise in the air. Never before had he, who was wont to carry spotted seals, had such a weight on board. Feeling his strength giving way, and knowing nothing better, he tried to capsize his kayak to the left, but was greatly perplexed to find his oar striking against a hard substance below, though out in deep water. At this he got up. But in attempting to turn his kayak to the right, he again hit something hard, on which he slowly righted himself, and rode away, at the same time perceiving that he was regaining his strength. But though he pulled homewards with all his strength, he found it impossible to make his kayak go straight. It kept turning round, carrying him towards uninhabited places. The Tupolak now cried, Thou hateful creature, I see I have made a mistake, and climbed up to one of uncommon kind, viz., a man endowed with a certain degree of Angakok power. And he noticed it struggling hard to get down, but without being able to detach itself. Thus he went on pulling away to the sunny side of the firth. When they were quite close to the beach, the Tupolak said, I see I shall not get through with thee, and I think I shall be made thy prize. Just then the man on looking round discovered a boat occupied by women, who had been farther up the firth getting Angmagsat, Kaplans. He called out to them, I have got something on my kayak that is not a seal. Put ashore yonder and come round this way quickly. When they had done as he told them, he went on saying, Don't attack it in front, as it might be dangerous to you. The foremost among them on seeing the beast fled in terror. The kayaker again began to lose strength, but at length his repeated calls caused the women to come back, bringing with them oars, intending to use them as levers, the beast sticking fast, as if glued to the kayak. At length it gave way, and a cracking noise was heard, whereupon he was able to get out and look at the monster, which proved to be the size of a large firth seal. Turning to the oldest of the women he said, I do not care to touch it, ye cut it up. I shall repay you hereafter. In expectation of the reward she at once fell to and cut open the tupolak, which she found stuffed with all kinds of bones, such as of birds, walruses, and seals. They had it entirely destroyed by sinking part of it in the sea, and hiding the rest of it in some old tombs. This done, he prepared to row home, but first said to the women, Thanks to you and your roaming thus about, without which I wonder how I had fared. I will take care to repay you, I am not likely to forget you. At home he told his adventure, and all now felt sure that it must have been the Tupolak which had formerly killed the two traitors. After this all travellers were unmolested, and the women were well paid by Avatarswak. Some time now elapsed without anything remarkable happening. Toward spring, however, he found himself in want of several necessaries, such as lead, powder, and tobacco, and set out for the European settlement at Pamiat. Having finished his business there, and rested during the night, he turned homewards, rather uneasy about a quantity of drift ice which had accumulated at the mouth of a firth he had to cross. Before he reached the spot, the land wind set in, and came storming down upon him, and the sky looked black and threatening. Still he tried to cross the firth, winding his way through the small passages between the broken ice. At length, however, he found himself almost entirely stopped, and at the same time saw a large iceberg drifting down upon him. He tried to escape, but presently heard the roar of its calving, breaking, right alongside him, and pressing him deep under the waters. However, he rose on the other side of the broken piece, and again sped along, but on the shady side of the firth he was once more overturned by a much larger iceberg, and this time he quite lost his senses. How long he was in this state of stupor is not known, 
but on reviving he noticed the strings of his kayak jacket rattling about, and smiting his back with the quick motion, while he was pushed on towards the land beneath the waves. He had no kayak, but found himself sitting down, the loose bottom skin of his kayak fastened round him, and having his kayak stick for an oar, and with one leg somewhat bent. In front he saw someone in a large hood rushing on and cleaving the waters for him, and behind he heard someone talking, but without being able to make out the words. These companions proved to be his grandparents protecting their grandson. When they came nearer to the islets he felt exceedingly thirsty, and presently discovering an iceberg with a fine spring flowing from it he wanted to go and quench his thirst. But at that moment he heard a warning voice behind him saying, Dear grandson, do not drink of the fountain designed for those perishing at sea, if thou drinkest thou wilt never return. At length he was carried far towards the head of the firth, and saw light from the windows of a very large house. Presently a woman in a white jacket came out of the doorway, then another, and at last a man in a reindeer cloak, followed by others, all being dogs in shape of men, and running down on the beach to him. When he entered the house there were people sitting together at its southern end, keeping watch over a dying brother. Having got inside he fell down beside the first lamp, but still could hear one of the men say, An Anginiartic has come among us. At that instant, on being handled by them, and touched upon his bare skin, he lost all consciousness, but soon after revived, hearing a sweet tune of a song from his childhood. At the very moment he revived the sick man breathed his last. The people of the house put a new skin underneath him, and let him remain perfectly quiet in his own clothes for five succeeding days, after which he began to stir about a little, and longed to get home, but he had no kayak. One day, however, a woman went down along the beach to gather the red seaweed, and returned saying, Only fancy. I have found a complete kayak drifted ashore to us. When they had gathered on the beach, and duly inspected it, they made it out to be the kayak of their Anginiartic, in perfect order, and lying just above high water mark, and well closed by the half jacket. On opening this they also found his goods, not a single implement amissing. The next day he returned, and from that time upwards he became still more of a wise man, and no witchcraft could ever work upon him. 80. About the men from the Firth visiting the people at the open seashore. There once lived three brothers at the head of a Firth not far from Nook, Goodhab. They were born Firth people, and never thought of approaching the outer sea coast. But on learning that great flocks of ox were to be met with at Kanyak, at the mouth of the Firth, they agreed to make a trip thither. When they were ready for their departure, however, the youngest changed his mind and would not be of the party. So the other two went off by themselves. Arrived at Kanyak, they first intended to land at the outermost point, not being aware of the heavy surf setting in upon it. When the men of the place saw them in their trouble, they said to each other, It is plain the Firth people yonder know nothing about surf, now we will have some fun with them. Meantime the visitors had put back, and were looking for a place nearer the habitations, where the landing was easier. But the men called out to them, We never land anywhere but at the point yonder, it is rather an awkward thing, and cannot be done without letting the surf roll over you, however, that is the way to do it. The two poor fellows retired abashed. And paddling back to the great breakers outside the cape, they almost doubted their words. However, as the men on shore continued encouraging them, the eldest brother first paddled back, and when at the right distance from shore, he suffered himself to be carried right in upon the rocks by a monstrous wave. While he quickly made fast his or by his kayak strings. At the moment the wave broke over him, he had loosened his jacket from the kayak, and took a leap, jumping on shore, where he waited the next roller, which brought in his kayak, which he grasped hold of, at the right moment hauling it up. Not a word was uttered by any of the mockers, who stood in great consternation on seeing this daring act, which no one among them would have been able to accomplish. While the poor visitor was drawing up his kayak the other prepared to land in the same way, and he achieved it with even greater agility and swiftness than the brother. After this the men on shore took a sudden fancy to them, and vied with each other in inviting them to their houses. The elder, who had by this time found out their former intention of mocking them, replied, Poor worthless fellows like us are little fit to come here, 
but our younger brother would just be the man for you. However, he had no fancy for coming. In summer, when the mighty glaciers are throwing off the icebergs into the firth, and when the spotted seals appear, we always want to get at them, but we dare not venture out on account of the dreadful surf from the glacier. We only stand watching our brother, when he, heedless of the danger, crosses the firth, so you see that we are not at all the right ones to call in here. Still not a word escaped the others. After having put their kayaks and implements ashore, they entered the houses, and were regaled with ox, which they liked very much. However, they preferred the entrails to the flesh itself, thinking them more like the entrails of gulls, which were their usual food. The day after they went with the men ox catching, and having loaded their kayaks, they again turned homewards. 81. The Deserted Woman and Her Foster Daughter A woman, who had no brothers or sisters, lived with a little foster daughter at the house of a great seal hunter. The daughter was very docile, and always obeyed at the least word. Once, during spring, all the people belonging to the place went away fishing. The chief hunter only lingered behind, harboring wicked intentions. One calm morning he went outside the house and re-entered, saying, pack up your things. We must be ready to start. They now made all speed, and the lonely woman was not the least busy among them, she worked away as she never did before. When she had put her own poor bundles into the boat she hurried up for her ledge cover. But when she came outside again, she observed the foster daughter still standing on shore watching their master closely, and when she herself came down he leaped into the boat, and shoving off, called out to them, ye only eat our food. We won't take you along. So saying, their housemates turned their backs upon them, and got under way. The poor creatures, whose scanty belongings had all been put into the boat excepting the ledge cover, on seeing the boat depart, faced each other in blank despair, and then burst into tears. However, when the boat was out of sight, the widow wiped her eyes, and said, Never mind, my dear, we must just do without them. But the child was not so easily consoled. When at length she stopped crying, her mother said, Let us go and find out a house to make our home. They went through all the deserted huts, but everywhere the walls were bare and the hangings removed, till at length they came into one without windows, where the skin still hung on the walls, and the old one said, Here, in the southern corner. We'll take up our quarters. She at once proceeded to make a room of suitable size, dividing it from the rest of the house with the skins. This done, she continued, let us now go outside and try to find something to eat at the flensing place. She took the child by her hand, and they soon found some small bits of blubber and skin, which they greedily devoured, having had no food the whole day. After this meal they lay down to rest, but were unable to sleep because of the cold. The next day, after a similar search, they found the entrails of an entire seal. After this, however, they found nothing more, and had only the entrails to live upon. It was just when the herds of seals are passing along the coast that their stock of entrails was exhausted. One morning, having taken a small morsel, they noticed that there was only a bit left for their supper at night. Then the widow said to her daughter, Child, thou art more strong and active than I, thou must go and dig a hole over yonder beneath the window ledge. The daughter obeyed at once, and began to dig up the loose earth. When she had finished, the mother repeated, Thou art more brisk and active than I, run away and fill the hole with water. The daughter continued fetching water from the sea, and before evening the hole was filled. That evening they took their last bit of food, and went to rest, but without being able to sleep. In the early morning the mother said, I shall probably not succeed, still I think I will try to procure something, by magic. The daughter did not like the idea, nor did she believe in it, but the mother rejoined, when I commence my incantation, as I repeat it again and again, thou must listen attentively. She soon began, and as she went through it, warned her daughter to attend well. The child listened, and presently heard a splash, on which she exclaimed, Mother dear, there is something moving in the water. When the old woman told her to see what it was, she ran off to look, and seeing a little frog fish, called out, Ah, mother, it is a frog fish. The mother told her to kill it with the old grindstone, probably an amulet. 
The little girl obeyed, and the fish was boiled and cut in two, putting aside one half for their evening meal. Next morning the mother repeated her incantation, and they got a nepisac fish, Cyclopterus lumpus. The next day, in the same way, an eider duck, and so on the following days, a firth seal, a saddleback seal, a small dolphin, a white whale, and at last a narwhal. When she had done flensing the captured animals, the following day large quantities of different kinds of provisions were heaped up outside the house. Towards evening they went to the top of a rock sloping south to cut the flesh in thin slices for drying. While they're engaged the daughter exclaimed, I almost think I see a kayak coming in, and in this she was quite right. The lonely woman had one relative, a very aged man. And this poor fellow, having lately heard of the manner in which she had been abandoned and left in an empty house, now came to see if she had not starved to death, bringing with him a frogfish as a gift in case she was still alive. When he saw the flensing place all red with blood he could not believe his own eyes, but thought it all a delusion. And when he observed the two women standing on the rock and slicing large pieces of flesh for drying, and when they afterwards came running down to receive him, he accosted them, Here am I. Expecting to find you starved to death, I actually came to bury you. She answered him, Silly old thing thou art. Just get thee out of thy kayak, and partake of our good fare here. The poor old man went ashore, but tasted nothing till he had pulled his kayak properly up on the beach. The women had meanwhile boiled him a nice dish. He took his fill for once, and when he wanted to start they stuffed his kayak with such a supply that it was almost ready to sink. On leaving he said, as it is, there is no fear of your starving to death, when all your provisions are ready prepared I shall come to fetch you off. When he was gone they went to rest, and the morning after she again made ready to practice her art. However, she chanted and invoked, and chanted again, and the daughter watched and listened as usual, but neither breathing nor splashing was heard. The reason was that they had taken offense at her having made the gifts over to other people, and from that time upward she never succeeded in calling forth anything. When her magic spell had wholly lost its effect, and she had finished drying her stock of flesh, her poor old relative came and fetched her off to his own homestead, and there she remained the rest of her days with him. 82. Isigarsagak Isigarsagak and his younger brother once set out on a journey northwards, and did not stop till the frost obliged them to establish themselves for the winter before they had reached their goal. Not till the middle of next summer did they arrive at their place of destination, where they found a number of people all friendly and well inclined, and therefore they resolved to pass the next winter with them. Winter went by in the usual way. But when spring came round, some of the people at times would say, at midsummer time we shall no doubt again see the dark stripe. This implied the intention of going a trip to Achillinek, the country beyond the ocean. But the strangers could not understand their meaning. One day a man came up to Isigarsagak saying, We all of us intend to go a voyage out seawards to Achillinek, with that view thou wouldst do well to gather skins for a double coating to thy boat. He followed this advice, and when all had got their boats new coverings, he noticed that every morning the inhabitants mounted the top of a hill to take a survey of the ocean. Sometimes he joined them, and then they used to say, Much as we long to be off, we dare not risk it yet. But at length the rattling noise of the tent poles woke him one morning, and when he saw the others had almost finished carrying their things down to the boats, he hastened to pull down his tent, and being also ready, the boat started. They stood to sea at once, and when the outer covers got wet and began to slacken their speed, they cut their fastenings and cast them off. Isigarsagak dropped astern a little, and had almost given up hope of seeing land again, when suddenly he heard land shouts ahead of him. As he listened again, he could make out that they cried, the broad dark stripe. And presently he saw it looming out, and when he rose and stood upright he beheld a broad expanse of land. The travellers now broke out into exulting shouts that they had reached the opposite shore without a gale, and on coming close to the land they found it abounding with reindeer. They moored their boats, and at once went off shooting, but Isigarsagak and his brother slew the greatest number. They decided on staying at this place for a sea sun. Some time after there was heard a cry of, boats. Isigarsagak went out and saw a great number coming down from the north. 
These travelers also took up their quarters there, but Isigarsagak did not care to assist them, and remained in his tent. Before long, however, there was a cry at the entrance, Isigarsagak and his brother are called upon to come out for a singing match, myth songs or satirical songs. Although Isigarsagak had no idea of singing, they made themselves smart and went outside. They saw an enormous crowd of people all going uphill, the men in front, the women following. As soon as they were seen there was another shout, let the men from east step forward. The brother of Isigarsagak first performed a dance and retired. Isigarsagak himself was now summoned, but as he did not know much about either singing or dancing he proposed to his wife to advance, who was so smart and clever that nobody could match her. The brother of Isigarsagak being unmarried now took a wife in this place, but as his brothers-in-law came to like him uncommonly well they would not allow him to leave them. The year being far advanced, they all prepared to cross to their own land, giving their boats new covers. Though Isigarsagak had been greatly attached to his brother, and did not like the idea of leaving him, he wished to die in his own country, and therefore made ready to follow his countrymen. At length they started. But a little way off land Isigarsagak said to his people, It occurs to me that I forgot to divide our healing remedy, viz., amulet for health and longevity. What a pity! We shall have to go back. Accordingly they went back and unpacked the things again. Opening an old box he produced something like a small bit of coal from a fireplace, this being an amulet given to him and his brother in common. He broke it into two pieces, and gave one of them to his brother. The boat was again loaded, and steering right out to sea, he turned round to see the last of his brother, who stood watching them on the beach in his white reindeer jacket. They were never to meet again, so he did not take his eyes off him till he was quite lost to sight. The boat safely reached their own shore without encountering any storm. Isigarsagak now began seal hunting with his children, but in time these grew old and died successively. Then he went out in company with his grandchildren, as yet without losing strength himself. It was not till his grandchildren were getting aged that he began to feel a little less handy himself. He was much beloved by his grandchildren, and they often went with him to a craggy reddish cliff, a favorite spot of his, where a number of gulls had built their nests, and the grandchildren's children would call to him, saying. Here we are at thy favorite cliff. Do sing to us. He had a fine voice, and could also imitate the cries of birds, which delighted the urchins beyond everything. This generation also died, and their children became his companions. But his grandchildren's grandchildren had to carry him in a boat, and to treat him like a child. His strong frame had now grown thin and shrunk like that of a baby. He ate almost nothing, and to know whether he still breathed they used to hold a bit of down before his nose. In passing by the bird's cliff they would say, Now we are at thy favorite spot. Do sing a song and listening sharply, they could hear a small feeble sound like the cry of a bird. At length he began to suck his coverlet. And one day when they came to take him out as usual, they observed that the feather before his mouth did not stir, he had breathed his last. Isigarsagak never had his like with regard to old age in this country, Greenland. He got quite as old as Nivnitak. His younger brother may even have outlived him, but he had never been heard of. It is through him that we are related to the people of Akilinek. 83. Italianguac. Italianguac was an excellent seal hunter, and lived as a bachelor in a large house, together with several cousins. At springtime he used to go out all by himself in his boat in order to fish Angmagsat, Kaplans. One evening when he returned to his tent, having been out kayaking, he was much surprised at seeing a pretty little woman standing outside of it. She wore a pair of white boots, and her hair tuft was newly dressed. Italian Wack ran quickly up beside her, and taking hold of her hand brought her into the tent, and afterwards married her. When the fishing season came to an end he repaired homewards in his boat, his wife rowing, while he himself took the helm. In autumn he again settled down in the house of his cousins. One evening just as his wife had risen from her seat on the ledge to go outside, one of the other people, whom she happened to pass by, remarked, What a very peculiar smell I perceived. 
But his housemates told him to take great care not to offend her, as they had observed that she was not a woman of the common kind. The same thing, however, happened again. This time the little woman hearing them speak of a strange smell rushed quickly out, and the moment she passed the doorway the people observed a foxtail dangling at her back. Italian Guac pursued her to the border of a lake. In a foxhole close by he noticed a light, and peeping in he saw his wife sitting on a ledge. He called out, I feel so cold, let me come in. Well, come. But in what way am I to enter? Thou hast only to breathe upon the entrance and thou wilt easily get in. Thus be entered, and sitting down beside his wife, he exclaimed, It is dreadfully cold, do make me warm. At the same time B saw one of the walls covered with flies, dirt flies, beetles, and all kinds of reptiles. She now raised up her head and ordered them to lull Italian Guac to sleep, and presently they all began singing, Italian Guac, sleep, sleep. At spring we will rouse thee again and he slept for ever so long. At last he awoke of his own accord, and when he rose and went outside the sun was high in the sky, while the cave itself swarmed with flies and reptiles. He went to make water, and forthwith it turned to a whole river. From that time he gave up all thought of womanhood. 84. A Visit to the Giants The orphan boy Inasarsik was greatly loved by his foster mother, but not by his foster father. One day, when the father was out on a seal hunt, the mother told Inasarsik she was tired of seal flesh, and ordered him out in her husband's other kayak to catch some frogfish. He remonstrated, saying that his father had forbidden him to take the kayak, but still she went on desiring him to go, at the same time assuring him she would clean and put it back all right in its place. Notwithstanding, the father coming home observed that it had been used, and beat Inusarsik till he could not move for pain. Another day his mother went on persuading him in the same way to take the kayak in order to go out and get her some quanic, the eatable stalk of Angelica Archangelica, growing near the shore, a little up the firth. But when he had ascended the hills in order to fetch her some, and came back to the beach, he found, to his great alarm, that the tide had carried away the half-jacket belonging to his foster father's kayak. On approaching home he got so frightened at the thought of his foster father that he passed it by and turned right out to sea. Having rowed beyond the outermost islands he suddenly remembered his two amulets, a quanic and an old whetstone. And jumping out on a flake of drift ice, he planted one of his newly gathered stalks, calling out, Thus shalt thou remain standing erect, an invocation to secure him calm weather. Like Giviac, he passed by the ocean lice for a kilinek, and having first encountered the cannibals, he afterwards fell in with the women who captured fishes by putting bladders to them at low tide. From the cannibal's chimney a black smoke arose in the air, but from that of the latter a white smoke was seen. Among these he was very kindly treated, but still he at last grew tired of his sojourn. And one day pretending to row a little in the neighborhood, he took himself far off, and fled to the south. At length he arrived at a wide firth, but thinking it too long to enter, he resolved merely to cross the inlet to the opposite shore. When halfway across he saw what he fancied was a rock. But on coming closer he found it to be an enormously big kayaker, who took hold of him and lifted him up quite easily, kayak and all, in one hand, and put him down before himself on his own vessel. Intending to take him home as an amulet for his little daughter. When they approached the homestead of the giant, something like a big iceberg was standing in front of the house, on closer inspection it proved to be an enormous gull, which the giant's daughter was in the act of catching. Inusarsik was now brought up to the house and put upon a shelf near the window. During the night he took a fancy to some very nice-looking eatables lying behind the lamp. He managed to slide down on the side ledge, but finding it quite filled up by the giant's sleeping daughter, without any room left where to put down his foot, he had no choice left but to step along her one leg. Unfortunately he lost his footing and fell down. The giant's daughter on being awakened in this way, and unconsciously grasping him, had nearly eaten him up, but luckily remembered that he was her little amulet. The giant seeing Inusarsik's dismay and utter dejection, at length put him down on the floor, and covered him up with his large cloak, saying, Thou shalt grow as big as that, as big as that. 
he forthwith cornments to grow, and was soon as tall as the daughter, after which the giant furnished him with a kayak of suitable size. He now remembered his foster parents. And longing to take revenge for the many blows he had formerly got, he crossed the ocean, and soon found the place where they had formerly lived. But the house was laid waste, and the old people buried beneath its ruins. He then returned to pass the rest of his days at Achillinek. 85. Kagsuk. The story here given as having happened in the districts of Holsteinsborg and Suckertoppen, in Greenland, is perhaps a variant of an older tale, only localized in this way. We give it here in an abridged form. It is said that Kagsuk once had his wintering place on the Karset Islands, outside of Amerdlok, Holsteinsborg, and that his son married the only sister of some men living at Satok, near Manitsok, Suckertoppen. Kagsuk, as well as his son, were powerful and strong men, the former was also a manslayer, invincible to his enemies. Once, when the son had been out during the day with his brothers-in-law, at evening, when it was growing dark, he had some talk with his wife that ended in a quarrel. Her brothers, fearing his strength, at first kept silence. But soon after, when he gave her a kick, they all went up to him and seized him in order to protect their sister. He tried to appease their wrath, but in vain, and at last they struck him with a knife. But every time he was wounded he only rubbed the place with his hand, and directly it healed, after which he knocked them all down, one after another. From this time, however, he did not trust his brothers-in-law. And once, at dark night, he escaped from the house, leaving his kayak behind, and taking his way across the fast ice to the north, where he stayed a while with some other people, and at length came to the house of his father. When Kagsuk came to know how his son had been treated he got into a great rage. In vain the son tried to persuade him to delay his revenge. If they have struck thee with a knife, he replied, we will set out and destroy the people of Satok this very night. And off they went the same day for Satok, and slew the whole of them, only sparing a boy and a girl. On returning to Karsit, Kagsuk became a still more desperate murderer. The people of Amardlok, on becoming aware of this, did not venture themselves far away from the shore. Kagsuk and his son, being both very suspicious, agreed on the following mode of life, if the weather was fine, the son went out kayaking alone, and when the father went out, the son remained at home, unless it happened to blow very hard. In which case, and then only, they went out together. One winter, when the days were beginning to lengthen, two kayakers from Amardlok, while out seal hunting, were overtaken by a snowstorm, and could not make out their own land. Bewildered, they came to Kagsuk's house. At seeing which they got very frightened, lest he would kill them. As soon as they saw him come out of his house, and before he could utter a word, they said, Chance brought us hither, and no intention of visiting you. We lost our way on account of the snow, and could not advance against the storm. Kagsuk asked them to come on shore, adding that, as soon as the weather abetted, they might set off for home. On hearing this they were reassured, and entered the house, which was very hot. Kagsuk talked a great deal the whole day, but in the evening, when it was still blowing a gale and snowing as fast as ever, he suddenly became silent. At length he inquired, which kayak is he using today? The housemates answered, the narrow one. Kagsuk then remarked, I was rather uneasy about him, but if he has taken that kayak I have no fear. Later in the evening there was a cry that he had arrived, tugging a walrus. And when the people whose business it was to haul it up on shore had gone out, Kagsuk said, they don't intend to stop, but having lost their way, chance to come in here much against their will. The guests, looking round, then first discovered that he was speaking to his son, who appeared in the entrance, and already had bent his bow and was aiming at them, but now drew back, and directly after entered. Asking if the guests had been offered something to eat. On hearing that they had as yet had nothing, he ordered different dishes to be set before them, saying he would share the repast with them. They afterwards went to rest, and slept quietly until Kagsuk roused them up, saying that now the weather was fine, they might as well start for their home. At their departure he ordered their kayaks to be filled with provisions, but at the same time added, take care that none of your people come hither to visit us, lest we should take their lives. 
They then pushed off, and arrived safely at their home. But when the people of Amardlok saw the stores they had brought with them, they were all keen to visit Kagsuk. And notwithstanding their being repeatedly warned by those two chance visitors of what Kagsuk had threatened, several among them would not desist from trying their chance. They went accordingly, but never returned. Among the kayakers lost in this way were the sons of two old men, who were very clever in magic spells. They prepared bows of an arm's length, and having finished these, they said to their place fellows, Now we will set out to punish Kagsuk, while ye approach his house from the seaside, we will come on from behind. Kagsuk had for his amulet a tuglik, the great northern diver, Columbus Glacialis, perched on the roof of his house, and giving him notice of every impending danger. One day on hearing its cry he went out, and observing the kayakers approaching, he said, All right, I see you. But at the same moment the two old men, having escaped observation by means of magic spells, came stealing on from behind and shot him dead on the spot. The kayakers, coming on shore, killed all his housemates, with the exception of his son, who happened not to be at home, and afterwards fled to the north. Note. Some narrators have prolonged the story of Kagsagsuk by making him meet with Kagsuk in the far north, the house of the latter being situated on a wide plain, the entrance to it being provided with a string leading into the inner room. And all along hung with a row of pieces of walrus teeth, for the purpose of announcing the entrance of every stranger by the rattling sound. 86. The Dream and Conversion of Akamalik this tradition appears to rest upon an event mentioned by Krantz in his History von Gronland, as having taken place in the year 1743. But it is given here in a very much abridged form, from two manuscripts, a great portion of which was merely copied out from the New Testament, and some other religious books. I end the days when missionaries had come to Nook, good have with New Hernhut, but people in other places were still heathens, there lived in the south a clever and skillful seal hunter, named Akamalik, who had a cousin of whom he was very fond. However, it chanced that this friend of his fell ill and died, which caused him much grief, and sorely depressed his spirits. As chance would have it, the women of the place at that time brought forth no sons, and his own wife being childless, he could get no namesake for his deceased friend. He henceforth fell into the habit of ill-treating his wife, kicking her and piercing her skin with an awl. After some time it was rumored that a woman of a neighboring place had borne a child and named it after his friend. On hearing this, Akamalik at once hastened thither, and was so glad at seeing the babe that he was quite unable to sleep for five succeeding nights. Having returned home, sleep at length was again restored to him, and then he dreamt as follows, someone peeped in at the window, and calling out for him said that he was to come and get his piece of blubber from a young whale which was just being caught. He at once went out and followed the voice, the owner of which he now perceived was a woman. In running after her he came across a vast plain, stretching forth like the surface of the ocean, and gradually rising. It became brighter and always brighter, he passed over heaps of sand, rolling dreadfully like a mountain river, and saw a crowd of people playing at ball with a walrus head. Akamalik would fain have stopped and joined the players, but the woman hurried him on, and, almost against his will, he constantly followed her. However, he wondered greatly. For in those people, on close view, he plainly recognized men who had died a number of years ago. He then came to three high steps, which it appeared impossible to ascend. But merely looking at his guide, he gave a leap and almost unwillingly mounted them. From the top he again saw before him a great plain, and a crowd or people in beautiful clothing. Among them he recognized a man in the murder of whom he himself had taken an active part many years ago, and could not but be astonished at hearing people talk in answer to what he was thinking of but had not yet spoken out. Voices were then heard calling the crowd to divine service, the people all sallied forth, and he followed their steps, passing over a dreadful abyss with fires burning down in the depths. Then they ascended still higher to a place so dazzlingly bright and beautiful as he never had seen before. Here the Saviour himself was preaching and leading the song of innumerable people. The Saviour spoke to Akamalik, reproaching him with his sins, at the same time pointing out to him the abyss, 
where he told him that Tornersuk resided in the depths, and advised him, saying, Next summer thou must repair thee to Nook for the purpose of getting instructed. The Saviour guided him on his way back across the abyss, and thus going downwards, on approaching the earth again he, viz., his soul, beheld his own poor body, walking backwards and forwards all void of intellect, people believing him to be mad. It appeared very uncouth in his sight, all covered with maggots, but though he greatly abhorred it, he nevertheless entered into it, having no other abode. Having thus put on the garb of his body, he became like dead and lay in a swoon. By and by he recovered his reason, and was awake. He then repented his profligate life, went to Nook in the spring, and was baptized by the Moravian missionaries. He not only became a Christian by name, but also a good man and a loving husband. Fragments Note. Dot, of the following tales only the principal parts have been selected, and are given here in a very fragmentary form. 87. Sanjiak, or Nurngajarak. A man whose wife could beget no children was advised by an old wise man to set off in his kayak, and go out to the open sea, and when he heard a voice like that of a child crying, he was to proceed in that direction, and would then find a worm. Which he was to take home and throw upon the body of his wife. Having done it, the worm disappeared in the body of his wife, who soon gave birth to a son, whom they called Sanjiak. While he was yet a small child, he asked his father for a kayak. And when following his father out to sea, he surprised him by hitting two seals, though he only threw his harpoon once. He acquired the art of always taking the whole flock of seals by only throwing at one of them. At last his father hardly knew how to bring home all the seals he captured. Once Sanjiak happened to get acquainted with another seal hunter, who could also take two seals at a time, but only by means of two harpoons, which he threw one with each hand at once. This double-armed kayaker being much beloved by his companions, Sanjiak grew envious of him, and once when he went out alone with him to sea, he picked a quarrel with him, and killed him. He then told his father what had happened, and that he would give the relatives of the double-armed notice of the murder. The relatives would fain have avenged it. But he took flight in his kayak, which, though his enemies had cut holes in its bottom, did not sink. Having filled his kayak with stones, he stopped the holes with them, and returned to his father safe and sound. 88. At Lungwak was a miserable hunter, despised and mocked by his housemates, who only saw in him a poor wretch always sitting behind his mother's lamp, and feeding upon what the others brought home. But when some deed of special daring, which no one else cared to undertake, was on hand, he at length bestirred himself, and braved the danger alone. Thus, he first killed an ice-covered bear, then an amarok, and finally a kilifak, all fabulous animals. 89. Nakasunnak traveled far up north, and settled down with some people who used boats, but no kayaks. He was very presumptuous and obstinate. His new place fellows told him that before long the ice-covered bear would make its appearance, that it was very dangerous, and for mere men a deed impracticable to slay it. But Nakasunnak, nothing heeding, set out to encounter the terrible animal, and on discovering it, he ran in upon it only armed with a knife. He instantly disappeared down its open mouth. The bear was then seen to totter, and soon after fell down dead. On approaching it, they observed a knife sticking out between its ribs, and when the hole was widened Nakasungnak jumped out of it. But his hair, as well as the skin of his face, had come off, and shivering with cold and ague, he ran away to the house. In the meantime, the bear's flesh served them for food the greater part of the winter. Afterwards they told Nakasungnak how to behave when they were going to catch the birds that could speak, and the little fishes with both eyes on one side. The swarms of birds and fishes appeared. But Nakasungnak would not follow the advice they gave him, and consequently got none. Lastly, they told him that gnats were soon expected, the size of sea fowls, and with stings like the point of an arrow. And when the swarms were approaching, and seen to come on like broken clouds from the south, the people had to retreat to their tents and close them with all care. Nakasungnak, however, again disregarded their warnings, and took no notice of what they had said. When the clouds appeared, and all the others sped into their tents, he remained outside. 
When all was over, and they went out to look for Nakasungnak, they found only a skeleton lying beneath the boat. 90. The Angha Keda, a company of brothers had a single sister, and would not allow her to marry. Nevertheless, having many suitors, she finally came to be with child, and because of her brother's reproaches, she secretly had a miscarriage, but the child got intellect, and became an Angiak. It picked up the skull of a dog, using it as a kayak, and the bone of a man's arm for a paddle. Every night it used to creep into the house and lie down to suckle its mother's breasts, but during the daytime it was about pursuing her brothers when they were kayaking, and made them capsize and perish one after another. Having accomplished its revenge, it repented its deeds, and fled to the north, where it slipped down in the doorway of a house in which a conjuration was going on. The Angakok, by means of his second sight, at once observed its approach. And when the people of the house had got a light, and went to look for it, they were all frightened to death. It then became still more powerful, but went back again to its mother's abode, and found a refuge in a heap of rubbish. It now happened that the Angakok of the place was about to perform a conjuration for the purpose of finding out what had caused the brother's destruction. The sister, on being examined, first denied, but finally she confessed her sin, saying, What I brought forth was no real child. No sooner had she pronounced these words than the Angiak felt a pain in its head, and while she continued her tale, it lost its senses and died. 91. The Moon Dot Several stories are told about people traveling to the moon. The following are specimens of these myths. Kanak, on fleeing from mankind, felt himself lifted up from the ground, and following the way of the dead. At length he lost his senses, and on awakening again found himself in front of the house where the spirit, or owner, of the moon resided. This man of the moon assisted him to get inside, which was a perilous undertaking, the entrance being very large and guarded by a terrible dog. The moon man having then breathed upon Kanak in order to ease the pain that racked his limbs, and having restored him to health, spoke thus, By the way thou camest no man ever returned. This is the way thou must take, upon which he opened a door, and pointed out to him a hole in the floor, from which he could overlook the surface of the earth, with all the dwelling places of man. He regaled him with eating, which was served and brought in by a woman, whose back was like that of a skeleton. Kanak was getting afraid on perceiving that, on which the moon man said, Why, that's nothing, but lo! Soon the old woman will appear who takes out the entrails of every one she can tempt to laugh. If thou canst not withhold thy smiles, thou only needst to rub thy leg underneath the knee with the nail of thy little finger. Soon after the old hag entered dancing and whirling about, licking her own back, and putting on the most ridiculous gestures. But when Kanak rubbed his leg with the nail of his little finger, she gave a sudden start, at which the moon man seized her, and threw her down in the entrance. She went off, but afterwards a voice was heard, she has left her knife and her platter, and if she does not get both, she says she will overthrow the pillars of heaven. The moon man having thrown the knife and platter down the entrance, again opened the hatch in the floor, and blowing through a great pipe, he showed Kanak how he made it snow upon the earth. Lastly, he said to him, Now it is time to leave me, but do not be the least afraid, lest thou never shalt come alive. He then pushed him down through the opening, on which Kanak swooned. And on recovering, he heard the voice of his grandmother, whose spirit had followed and taken care of him, and at length he reached the earth's surface, arose and went to his home, after which he grew a celebrated Angakok. A barren wife, who was treated badly by her husband, went off one winter night and met with the moon man, who came driving in his sledge, and took her along with him to his home. Many days after in spring, she again appeared, and went to live with her husband. Ere long she perceived that she was with child, and gave birth to a son, who when he grew up was taken away by the moon man. Mangorak, unheeding the warnings of his father, caught a white whale which, having a black spot on one side, was known to belong to the animals of chase set apart for the spirit of the moon. On a fine winter night the moon man was heard to call him outside and challenge him to fight. When he came down upon the ice, the moon man said, Well, we will presently begin, but first let us name all the animals of chase we have caught during our lifetime. They then, each in his turn, 
named the different sorts of birds, seals, and whales they had chased. And beginning with the fishes, Mangorak went on to tell how he once assisted at a halibut fishing, when they happened to haul up a ra, Anarika's lupus. On hearing this, the moon man exclaimed, What art thou saying, man? Now just wait, and listen to me. He then went on to tell how, when a child, and still living among mankind, he had once seen some people haul up a fish of that same kind, at which he was so terrified that he had never since tried to catch that fish. And now, he continued, that I know thou hast caught an animal which I never ventured to pursue, I will do thee no harm. I begin, in fact, rather to like thee, so come along with me and see my place. Mangorak accordingly went up to ask his father's permission, which having gained, he returned to the ice, where he found the moon man waiting with a sledge drawn only by a single dog. When he had taken his place on the sledge, away they drove at a great pace, and gradually rising from the ground, they seemed to fly through the air. At midnight they came to a high land, upon which they still travelled on. They went through a valley covered with snow, and had to pass by a dark-looking cliff, inside of which lived the old hag who was wont to cut out the entrails of people who could not forbear laughing. As to the rest of the adventures of Mangorak, they are much the same as those encountered by Kanak. 92. The Woman Who Wanted to Be a Man A woman named Arnorquack would not give up scolding her son on account of his want of skill in hunting and other manly pursuits. Once in his absence, when he had gone out kayaking, she forced her daughter-in-law, by threatening her with death, to flee with her to the interior of the country, where she disguised herself like a man, and had her daughter-in-law, Uquamuk, for a wife. But the son found out their place of refuge, and killed his despicable mother. 93. An Angakok Flight A great Angakok, being once called upon to perform a conjuration, took a thong of seal skin, and having in one end cut a hole for his toe, he twisted it round his body, and made fast the other end to his head. When the lamps had been all extinguished, he was lifted up, and soaring about the house he made the roof lift and give way to him. Having escaped through the opening he flew to the inland, and came to a house inhabited only by women, but as soon as he tried to approach any of them the house pillar, their enchanted husband, began to emit sparks of fire and lean towards him. The next time he flew to the inland he was seized hold of by the inlanders, who essayed to play at ball with him, hurling him backwards and forwards between them till he was nearly dead, when he called his tornak, who quickly rescued him. The third time he came to his sister, who had disappeared many years before, but whom he now found married to an inlander. She gave him a piece of reindeer skin as a token to take home with him in order to convince people of his really having been with her. 94. The means for getting children. A married couple had in vain been in hope of getting children. At length the man set out in search of some means to attain their desire. The first summer he travelled as far as he could get to the north, and the next as far as possible to the south, before he succeeded in finding an old woman who promised to help him. From the bottom of her bag she produced two small dried fishes, a male and a female, of which he was to give his wife the former to eat if he wanted a son, and the latter in case they preferred a daughter. He received the fishes, and started on his way home, but having to travel very far, and not always being able to get any victuals, he once in a great strain for something to eat began to consider, what is the use of keeping this spawner? A son is what we desire, on which he swallowed the one little fish. After a while he began to feel very ill at ease, at the same time growing bigger and bigger, till at length he could hardly manage to slip down in his kayak. A skillful old woman, who lived at a place where he happened to land, soon suspected what was the matter with him, and hit on a charm to deliver him of what was encumbering his inside, which soon proved to be a fine little daughter. It is doubtful whether the rest of the tale is of genuine Eskimo origin. 95. Kangingwak was a native of the south, who set forth on a journey and took up his abode near Umanerswak, kin of Sale, a high island of South Greenland. He had a son named Tunarak, who was such an expert rower that he used to overtake the falcons in their flight, and killed them with a blow of his paddle oar. He went out to sea so far as to make a manorswack appear like a seal diving up and down among the waves. He also tried matches with celebrated kayakers, 
but on one of these occasions he was killed by his rival. His father afterwards went to the place where he was buried, brought out his body again and carried it along with him, till he found an angicock, who restored it to life. 96. K.I.G.D.L.N.R.S.U.K., in order to avenge the murder of his sister, went out in search of an old woman who could assist him in getting an amulet for giving swiftness to a boat. The first one he came to replied, I have grown rather old to no purpose, viz. Without having acquired wisdom, I am only clever in the forty-seven but farther north I have an elder sister more cunning than I, first try thy luck with her, and if thou dost not succeed I'll see what can be done. He then went farther, and came to another old hag, who gave him for an amulet a small bit of a dried merganser, Mergus serrator. This he inserted in the prow of the boat with such care that no marks or joints were visible. Twice he tried it before the boat appeared swift enough to run down a flying merganser, and not till then did he start to encounter his adversaries. 97. A man living on Karasuk, in the Firth of Goodhab, every day used to repair to Kangek, about twenty-four miles distant, for the purpose of hunting ox. For his companion he had an Ingerswak, who at the same time was the Tornak of an Angakok, living farther up the Firth at Tukak. It is said that even nowadays many kayakers have an Ingerswak for their companion, and every now and then they become visible. Sometimes a kayaker observing two distinct kayaks at a distance, on coming nearer will only meet with one, who on being questioned is not aware of any other having been with him. In such cases people believe it to have been an Ingerswak, on account of their being invisible, excepting from a great distance. The said Ingerswak in the short winter days came to Karasuk, waited until he saw the man ready to start for Kangek, and then followed, and took care of him the whole day, and returned with him to Karasuk. From whence he went on to his home at Tukak. 98. A Tarsuatsiak and his brothers were a set of fearful manslayers, living in the country about Upernivik, Greenland, who had their heads tattooed with a separate mark for each murder they had committed. On a Tarsuatsiak these marks formed a whole row along his forehead from one side to the other. At last the people of the neighboring places resolved upon having him killed at a place to which he used to resort in order to visit his concubine. 99. Among the last Angakut at Knjrdlugsuatsiak, Greenland, was a man named Kapiersuk, and a woman called Avangnanerswak, who every day during the whole winter used to go out together to catch partridges, but never brought any home. And never were seen to eat anything at all. At last a child, who was anxious as to their doings, one day asked leave to accompany them, and soon observed that they never looked for any partridges at all. But having come a good way up the country, Kapierswak commenced to strike a flat rock with his staff, and murmuring certain words, an opening appeared in the ground, out of which they went on angling and hauling up different kinds of food, allowing the child to partake of the good fare. On going home they gave it a small fish to swallow, after which it lost all remembrance of what it had seen. Not until he was full grown, many years after, did he suddenly recollect the event and narrate it. Another Angakok of the same place, named Kavatsiak, had two brothers, Yuzhuanak and Igpak, of whom the former, having gone out kayaking, did not return, and entirely disappeared. In the evening they saw the clothes of the missing brother moving about by themselves. Kovatsiak forthwith began to conjure, by means of which he found out that he had been seized by the Ingersut. Kovatsiak had a dream somewhat like that of Akamalik, and when he began growing old he often met with his deceased brother out at sea. He observed some black thing lying on the top of his brother's kayak, who labored in vain to rid himself of it, saying that that was the only impediment hindering him from leaving the underworld people and returning to the land of the living. When the first missionary came to the country Kavatsiak had a dream that induced him to get baptized. 100. Atungak, a tale from Labrador. A man named Atungak had two wives. One of them having run away, he pursued her in his sledge, and soon overtook her. They then traveled together, and came to cannibals, whose chief invited them to his house, and set before them a dish of man's and wolf's brains mixed together. When they declined eating it, Another was served consisting of the flesh of a child and of a walrus, and this also being rejected, they brought in dried reindeer flesh, which they ate with hearty appetite. 
Meanwhile the people got hold of some children, and feigning to pet them they killed them and sucked out their brains. A young lad was also there who carried a sling wherewith to entangle strangers. But when he approached Atungak with this design he was struck on the head with a piece of parite stone, and fell to the ground. Afterwards, when his mother came from another house to look for him she only found one of his legs left, lying under the bench, with the boot still on it, by means of which she recognized it. She then exclaimed, Ye have done very ill in taking that miserable Ajajasek, who ought to have served his younger brother for food. Atungak and his wife travelling on, came to a country the people of which were all lame. Before they reached them the chief came to receive them, and warned them against his people as being a very ill-natured set. Nevertheless, when Atungak's wife saw their ball playing, she could not help laughing, and said that they hopped about like so many ravens. Atungak got very much afraid when he heard the bystanders repeating this. He at once cut asunder all the lashings of the sledges belonging to the lame people, so that they could not pursue them. Hastening from there they came to two black bears engaged in a fight, and no other way being left they were obliged to pass between them. After which they came to a pot boiling of itself, which they could not avoid crossing over. Lastly, they came to a man watching at the breathing hole of a seal, and on speaking to him they recognized him as a Tungak's son, whom they had left behind a child. They had traveled over the whole world without changing or getting old. In the north, caves and clefts in the rocks are still to be seen, in which they are said to have rested. Note. This story, and the next from East Greenland, being both imperfect fragments, received from the most widely severed Eskimo countries, will be found to contain some very curious similarities. 101. Malerswak, A Story from East Greenland A man named Malerswak started in search of his lost sister. Traveling by sledge, he came to houses inhabited by cannibals, with one of which he found his sister domesticated. A hideous-looking youth came into the house, whom Malerswak killed by piercing his head with a bear's tooth fastened into a stick, whereupon the host threw the dead body under the bench. Some time after a woman appeared, saying, is this not my miserable son here, I mean the one who ought to serve as food for his brothers? Malerswak traveled homewards, but came back on a visit, bringing his wife and a little child with him. The cannibals robbed them of their child. When going to leave, the brother-in-law tried to persuade him first to cut all the lashings of his place fellow's sledges, in order to prevent their pursuing the travelers. Malerswak took his advice, but happened to forget one of the sledges, which came speeding after him, but he killed the driver and made his escape himself. 102, A Tale from Labrador Sikuliarcia Juitsak, on account of his great size, was unable to walk upon new ice. He, all by himself, caught a whale from his kayak. But he was much dreaded and hated, and never ventured to sleep in strange places. He was, however, once persuaded to stay for a night in a snow hut, and being too big to find room in it, he lay all doubled up, and allowed his feet to be tied together. In this condition he was hauled out and killed, but not before he himself had killed four men in the struggle. He had three sisters, one of whom had three sons, likewise powerful men. They had an enclosure, fenced in with stones, into which they enticed all those they intended to kill. 103 a Clawjack, a tale from Labrador. A man named Aklawjack was of immense strength. Once, when away on a reindeer hunt, his brothers robbed him of his wife. But the mother, who from a high hill observed him sitting in his kayak and seizing two large reindeers by the antlers and drowning them by holding them under water, hastened down and persuaded the wife to return to him. On which the brothers took flight. 104. The giant of Kangerswak or Cape Farewell the people from the south, or east, and those from the north, or west, were at war with each other. The latter had a powerful champion, who was sitting on the top of Kangerswak to watch the Southlanders passing by. A man who had been killed by him left a son, who practiced Angakok science, and revenged his father by inducing the giant to walk with him over a marshy plain, where he went down, and from beneath pierced the feet of the giant. And afterwards killed him. 105. The Kidnappers. A band of brothers tried to carry off a girl by force, but her mother, 
by means of a magic lay, caused them all to perish in a sudden gale. Some time after, an Angakok, who had been out kayaking, stated that he had seen a shoal of dolphins, and listening to their speech, he made them out to be those brothers, who had been thus transformed. 106. The Visiting Animals An old man, while staying in a firth to fish for salmon, lost his son, who died at some distance up the country. In his grief he could not persuade himself to leave his son's grave, and he therefore put up his winter house on the spot. In this lonely abode they were once surprised by seeing three men entering the house, one of them tall and long-nosed, the other smaller and with a flat nose, and the last a very small stature and white as snow. After passing the evening talking with the host, the short-nosed man, before starting, asked for a piece of sole leather, and the white one wanted a piece of walrus tooth. The old man saw the departing visitors out, but when they left him, stood dumbfoundered at seeing them bounding off in the shape of a reindeer, a fox, and a hare. It is said that the hare had need of something for a new tooth. 107. A Vigiatsiak was the name of a young woman who, while grinding her knife on the beach, was taken by a whale. After living for a time with the whales, she fled and was transformed into a seal, living with the seals. As such she was caught by a man, hauled upon the ice, and cut to pieces, all excepting the head, which was thrown beneath the bench. From thence she slipped into the womb of the man's wife who had harpooned her, and was afterwards born anew, and called a Vigiatsiak. 108. The Bird's Cliff A father and his son, while kayaking far off the land, fell in with a Kyariak, who at once gave chase to them. They fortunately escaped by jumping out on a flake of ice, from which they struck their persecutor dead. But before sinking into the sea he spat repeatedly, turning round to all parts of the horizon, on which a dense fog arose, causing them to wander, and preventing their gaining their home. At last they reached land, and the father, being Angakok, soon perceived a house and entered it. They found one side of it inhabited by black people, and the other by white ones. After staying a while and having some talk with the inmates on both sides, they left the house. But on looking behind them, they saw that the house was a cave in the rock, the inhabitants gulls and ravens, and a drollish visitor staying with them, a falcon. 109. Quanuck, an Angakok in South Greenland, started for a flight, having previously had his feet and his head tied together. While passing along between two high rocks, an Amarsiniuk rushed out from the mountainside and wanted to take him into his hood. He made his escape by dropping into the sea, and proceeding onwards beneath the surface of the sea and the earth, finally emerged from the floor of his own house. Another time, when he had gone off on a flight, his drum, which he had left in the house, was lifted up by itself, and soared about in the room till at length it stopped and fell down. At that same moment a voice was heard from without, and hastening to look whence it came, they found him in an almost dying state lying upon the snow, an old skin cover from a kayak having frightened him and caused his downfall. Quanak was once capsized by a seal he had just harpooned, but being an Inginiartic, his senses again returned, and he found himself at the bottom of the sea, in company with his grandmother. She tied his kayak jacket close to his body, leaving no part of it uncovered, and then supplying him with a piece of skin by way of kayak, she pushed him upwards. When he emerged from the water he first betook himself far out to sea, and thence made the land again, but happened to touch at an inhabited place, where somebody was emptying out the urine tub, which scared him away from the shore. He tried to land on another place, but here a woman, dressing her hair on the beach, scared him away. If he had a third time taken fright, he would never have returned to the land of the living. But he happened to land at Pasugfik, where a couple of old men were sitting playing at dice. They at once knew him to be an Inginiartic, and on merely touching his naked body, he dropped down senseless. But on their chanting a magic lay, he revived. They then brought him back to his homestead, where his relatives, who had already finished their days of mourning and nearly forgotten him, were gladly surprised at hearing the crew of the boat that brought him home in tuning Quanic's song. 110. An Angakok on Kekertarswak set off in his sledge to visit his married sister. On approaching the house his dog suddenly stopped. 
After in vain trying to urge them on with his whip, he alighted and went up to the house on foot. But seeing no people about, he looked in at the window, and was horror-struck at seeing all the people lying or sitting about lifeless, their eyes open and staring. His sister alone showed signs of life, and seeing her brother, began to move her mouth as if chewing, and crept towards the entrance. At sight of this he was struck with terror, and fled to his dogs, but was again unable to make them stir. Not until the sister had come quite close, her mouth widely opened as if to devour him, did they suddenly start, and thus he escaped to his home. Afterwards he performed a conjuration, and undertook an angicock flight to examine the place. On his return he reported that those people had been frightened to death by the sight of a skin cover from a kayak, viz., which had been used at a funeral to carry the corpse upon. 111. Singajuk and his descendants. Singajuk was a celebrated hunter living in Kanyak, near Godthab. His wife miscarried, and brought forth a poor little wretch of a child, that was swaddled in the skin of an eider duck, and had to be fostered with the utmost care to keep it alive. This child was called Manjalak, and became one of the most powerful of men. His first deed was killing an Ingerswak. Afterwards he was once caught in a gale of wind at sea, but s being a solitary spot of smooth water and a gull swimming in it, by dint of listening to its voice he learned a spell for procuring a calm. And from that time he was not to be equaled in kayaking. His mother then persuaded him to marry, and he took a wife, who, however, shortly afterwards died. Being almost an angicock, he used to visit her grave and talk with the deceased, and on one occasion she gave him a mussel shell containing a drink to endow him with angicock wisdom. Manjalak married a second wife, and got a son, called Akajarak, whose daughter became the grandmother of the man who related this story, to the author. Akajarak died a Christian. Manjalak also was baptized, and named Moses, but was too full of Angakok wisdom to become more than a nominal Christian. 112. The Cousins. This tale is somewhat similar to No. 15. But in the present version, the revenge is brought on by an Angakok, who assisted the cousins on a flight, and while staying with them invoked his Tornak, the Tulik, who carried a red hot weapon, and destroyed the house and all its inhabitants by fire, while the Angakok flew homewards. After his return to his house, while narrating the deed to his people, a laughing voice was heard from without, recognized as that of his Urkungasak, the ingenious and cunning adviser, but rather powerless and boasting dweller among the Tornaks, who came to give notice of his having also assisted at the destruction of his enemies. 113. Monik was a great seal hunter, but his mother in vain urged him to take a wife. He continued a bachelor, till one day he suddenly ordered his mother to make ready the boat for removing from the place. As soon as she had made all ready, he hastened up to the house of the chief hunter, who at the time was absent, and carried away his daughter, crying and struggling in vain to be released. Having placed her on the boat he at once pushed off, and made for the north with all speed. At the first inhabited place they came past he again carried away a woman, and this continued until he had got a complete boat's crew of rowing girls. He continued his voyage the whole season, till at length, having reached the far north, the frost set in, and for the time obliged him to take up his quarters there. While wintering here, and making excursions into the country, he once came to a solitary house, where he had an adventurous meeting with the ghost of a deceased woman. And from there he came to another, where he found the people feasting upon various meats, which they kept hauling from the ground by help of magic lays. The next year he set out for his own country, returning to their relatives all the women, excepting only the first one, whom he kept for his wife. 114. The Land of the Isarukitsak Bird, Alka Impenis, A Story from South Greenland Two young men with one elder companion lost their way when kayaking in foggy weather, and having roamed about without being able to sight any land, they came to a high promontory, showing one continuous steep and inaccessible cliff. Inhabited by crowds of Isarukitsaks. By following the coast they at last came to a landing place, and found a nice situation, where they rested themselves, and had their strength restored by eating birds. Having also filled their kayaks with them, they put off to sea again, 
and happened to pass by one of the monstrous gulls which are in the habit of picking up the kayakers and giving them as food to their young ones. But they reached their home in safety. It is told that before the land of the Isarukitsak sank there were plenty of these birds about Nook, Godthab. 115. Kakertuliak was at a reindeer hunt when they only succeeded in hitting one large deer, which made its escape by jumping into a lake. Kakertuliak, however, pursued it by swimming, and fastened a line to its antlers, by which it was hauled on land. He got a large piece of the tallow, and leaving the party, went off by himself in search of further game. He saw two ravens pursuing one another, but on viewing them more closely they had the features of man. At the same moment a reindeer suddenly bounded forth, apparently from his own bag, and he found the tallow at the same time had disappeared, a little morsel only remaining. He then felt himself lifted off his feet and carried away through the air. But by rubbing his skin with the bit of tallow he again quickly descended towards the earth, yet without touching it he gained his home. On arriving, however, he had lost the use of his senses, and lay down almost lifeless, though unable to die. Such was, as has been told, the condition of the heathen when the ruler of the moon had taken the souls out of their body. From this time Kakertuliak gave up hunting, and turned a clairvoyant. His soul used to leave the body in Rome about the inland and along the east coast, and on returning he related what he had seen, and how he had lived with the inlanders. 116, The Quinisarinuk. Ovnek, one of the last Angakut at the Firth of Godthab, on one of his spirit flights narrowly escaped being taken by an Amarciniuk. After his return he once performed a conjuration and summoned the Amarciniuk. A brightness was observed, and a voice was heard from above the house saying, If thou hadst not happened to be an Angakok thou wouldst never have escaped. It was I who killed the Quinisarinuk, another monster, dwelling in certain mountains, because it had torn a man to pieces. The auditors then remembered how some time ago a man had been found dead, and his body terribly mutilated. But nobody had been able to make out how the murder was committed, till it was thus explained by Ovnek. 117, an old man, who was always anxious to outdo other people, had laid a bet with his friend as to whose wife should first get a son. And afterwards, as to which of their sons should in course of time become the greatest Angakok. One of them, a Jagutarsik, attained Angakok wisdom in a cave, and the other, named Ularpana, acquired it in a dried-up lake. The latter went on an Angakok flight to the first, and while staying with him a Jagutarsik called forth his tornax, which belonged to the inlanders, and instantly appeared. But Ularpana invoked his tornax, being the upper Ingnersut, who totally defeated the inlanders. 118, The Revenging Animals. A great Angakok, while kayaking about at midsummer, suddenly took a longing for eggs. And landing upon an island, he found a merganser's nest with plenty of eggs, all of which be carried away. On his way home be met with a flock of seals, of which be harpooned one. But after having taken it, he heard voices from among the rest encouraging each other to go and get hold of a piece of ice, and return as Umiarasat. On getting home he walked up to his house, forgetting the eggs in his kayak. But he ordered his housemates to throw down on the beach all manner of filthy stuff to frighten away the Umiarasat. In the evening a boat was seen to arrive manned with seals, but as soon as they scented the filth they all jumped into the water, and the boat appeared as a piece of ice. Later in the evening a voice was heard outside, and the head of the gusander emerged from the entrance with dreadfully enlarged eyes. Addressing itself to the Angakok, it scolded him for having robbed it of its descendants, but now it had come to fetch its eggs back, having by help of a charm caused him to forget them and leave them in his kayak. If he had not left them it certainly would have frightened them all to death. Another Angakok in a similar case was bereft of his Angakok power by the merganser. 119, The Igdlok. A man had lost his beloved cousin and friend, who in his sight had been torn to pieces by one of those bears that are made by sorcery. In his despair be went out to encounter and brave all kinds of danger by way of excitement. And he first killed an Amarok. One evening, when staying at home, he was surprised in his lonely house by a stranger dropping in, who explained that he also having lost his brother was roaming about for excitement. 
Being very talkative, he spent the evening there very pleasantly, until the hostess, who had boiled some flesh of the Amarok, came and served it before the men. The guest then burst out in loud praises of its delicious flavor and tempting appearance, but before he had taken a morsel he went on, but I see the dish is all aslope, and the same instant arose and vanished through the entrance. The host immediately followed him, and on examining his footsteps in the snow, he found them to be made by only one foot, so that the guest must have been an iglocock, whose body is only the one half of the human body cut in twain. Note. In another similar story there are two guests, who at their sudden disappearance manifest themselves as certain stars, Saigtut or Ilugtsat. The mysterious words about the sloping dish are the same. 120. Iviangersuk travelled all around the coast of Greenland. He started for the south, and having passed Cape Farewell, he came on the eastward to some light-haired people of European complexion. And lastly he returned through the sound, which was formerly open from east to west, near Alulasat, Jakobshavn. When approaching his home near Godthab he lost his brother, who was buried upon a small island, after them named Uviarniak, one who travelled all around. 121 a married couple remained childless on account of their both being Angakok. The husband and wife always used to go out kayaking together. Once they happened to come to a foreign place, where a young man was found in an almost dying state. The Angakok man began a conjuration, summoning the witch who had caused his sickness. He detected the ghost of the witch approaching the sick youth in order to touch him with her black hands. But the Angakok thrust his harpoon at her, hitting her heel. And almost at the same moment the aunt of the sick youth died in the next house, and proved to have been the witch. While spending the rest of the evening there, eating and talking in a pleasant way, the visitors noticed the children playing on the floor. And thinking of their own childless state burst out, that crowd of boys might almost make people envious. They were answered, the boys yonder are the namesakes of those whom the monster gulls carried off as food for their young ones, viz., who perished in kayaks, whereupon the whole assembly at once became silent. 122. An old man lost his only son when they were both reindeer hunting up the country. After returning home he often used to visit his son's grave. Kayaking up the firth with this view, he once right before him saw an inlander pulling himself through the water without any kayak, using the fog as kayak, and after some angry words, he killed the inlander. Another time, when he was again visiting the grave, he was surprised at the sight of an inlander, who questioned him as to the cause of his grief. Yonder wretched heap of stones is the only object of my distress, he answered. The inlander then told him how he also had, some time ago, lost a son who had been seal hunting. The old man made out that it must have been the one he had killed. On which he pretended to be expected home, pushed off in his skiff, and never more visited the grave of his son. 123, Angakorsiak was very proud of his Angakok wisdom, and always roamed about seeking opportunities of emulating other Angakot. When he happened to surpass them, he used to mock and ridicule them in a most overbearing manner. Once he visited an Angakok far up north, and challenged him to a match, at which, in broad daylight, they were to contend in working the wonders of their art before an assembly. Angakorsiak began his performance by cutting off his arm near the shoulder, inserting it again and drinking the blood from the wound, after which he swallowed an arrow point and made it appear again, opened his stomach with a knife, and so on. When he had finished, the other Angakok repeated the same feats with the utmost perfection, and then remarked, Well, what we have yet done amounts to nothing, but I should now like to try a kayak race with thee. They went down in their kayaks, and the Angakok of the place, taking his way to an island, threw his harpoon at a rock with such force as to make it enter the stone and blood to spring from it. Angakorsiak on trying this entirely failed, his harpoon being broken and lost. On their way back to the shore he bent down his head from shame, capsized his kayak, and sank. But directly afterwards a reindeer emerged from the water, and ran up on the beach. Shame having thus transformed him into a reindeer, he afterwards turned a man again, and hastened away, resolved to give up all kind of emulation in future. Note. Of this tale several variants exist, 
the traditions about the deeds of Angakut, on the whole, being numerous. 124. A girl named Tuagtuanguak fled from her brother-in-law, who persecuted her. Running across the ice, she fell through. But having again got up, she ran on and on to the north constantly, viewing a black spot before her. Swooning several times, and again seeing the black spot on awaking, she meanwhile acquired Angakok power. Going on in this way for five successive days, she came to a precipice, and setting out from its edge, she leaped across, but was somehow wafted back through the air to the same spot. This process she continued for five days. She then pursued her journey north, and came to an inhabited place, where she took up her abode, and afterwards got married. She visited the Ingnersut, and received presents from them. But while carrying them homewards the gifts were wafted out of her hands, and flew back to their first owners. 125. The Gifts from the Underworld An old bachelor, feeling envious of a younger one because of his better luck in hunting and his finding more favor with women, applied to his mother for counsel and aid. She pointed out to him a certain spot where he would find a large stone, and moving it aside, an opening would appear leading straight to the underworld, where he would come to a lake. And on seeing two boats, he was to let the first one pass, but was to apply to the second. Acting upon her advice, he received a piece of matak, whale skin, from the second boat, by eating which he acquired astonishing good luck in hunting. The young man, noticing this change of fortune, questioned him as to the cause of his recent success, when he imparted to him the information he had gained from his mother, only substituting the first boat for the second. The young man in this way also got a piece of matak, by eating which he only secured the worst luck in his hunting. Meanwhile the old man had consumed his piece, and went to fetch more. But when he came to the spot the second time, he found himself quite unable to move the stone. 126. The Tupalak Dot, an old man named Nikuk, who had given up seal hunting, once, entirely by chance, brought home a walrus. The middle one of some brothers with whom he lived grew jealous of him at this, and every morning repaired to the opposite shore of an island, where he secretly worked at a tupolak. Nikuk got a suspicion of this, and following him, he surprised the wretch in the act of allowing his own body to be sucked by the monster, at the same time repeating the words, Thou shalt take Nikuk. But Nikuk hurried down, and seized him, crying, What art thou doing there? At that moment the man fell down lifeless. Meanwhile the brothers had also reached the island, and on being guided to the place by Nikuk, they found the Tupolak still sucking the dead. They then killed it with stones, sinking it, as well as the maker of it, into the sea. During five nights Nikuk was disturbed by a bubbling sound, but afterwards nothing more was perceived. 127. The Grateful Bear. A married couple lived on a lonely spot far from other people. When the man was out on his hunting ground his place of refuge used to be a snow hut. Once, when he was stopping in it, he saw his wife running about quite naked. Greatly excited, he hastened home, but found his wife inside the house, sitting quietly with her baby, without having stirred. The man now went raving mad, and the wife, frightened at seeing him in such a state, fled from the house with her child. When at the very point of starvation she chanced to catch a partridge, but seeing a terrible bald-headed bear approaching, she threw the bird to him and made her escape. Afterwards, when she had built herself a hut on the shore, she always got an ample supply of newly killed seals, which used to come drifting in, being gifts from the grateful bear. 128. The Inhabitants of Akilinek Iviangersuk, while traveling far and wide for some time, settled down in Akilinek, leaving descendants there. Many years after, some people from the farthest north, in crossing the ice, came to a crevice far off the coast, and had some talk with people who appeared on the opposite side and announced themselves as Iviangersuk's descendants in Akilinek. The countrymen from each side alternately enumerated all the products of their homesteads. 129. The mother and son as Kivigtut. A widow, greatly harassed by the persecutions of a man who wanted to marry her, fled to the inland with her little son, whom she educated with the view of making him a hater of the male sex. She built her hut near the border of the inland glacier, 
and made the acquaintance of another woman, who led the same solitary life on a bare hillock emerging from the glacier. When the sun had grown up, his reindeer hunting secured them ample subsistence. Once they were surprised by the visit of one of her brothers, who told them that, from the time they had disappeared, he had devoted himself to the study of Angakok science in order to find out her place of retreat. And having attained the powers of an Angakok, he instantly discovered her trace, by means of which he had found her out. He henceforth remained with them. The sister died from old age, and, later on, her son fell sick and died, but revived three times after his mother's brother had buried him. The fourth time, however, the latter pulled down the house on the top of him, and then left the place. While passing the night in a cave on his way towards the coast, he was overtaken by the ghost of the deceased appearing in the shape of a fire, with a voice saying, that from childhood he had been fostered up to hate the whole male sex. And had the other not been his mother's brother, he would certainly have killed him. 130. The help from Ingersuddin, an old man once met with an Ingerswak, who invited him to his house, and told him that he had watched in order to have some talk with him that no one else might hear. He wanted to let him know that, if ever he was in want, he only had to apply to him for help, the Ingerswak would at any time provide him with food. The old man from this time had a comfortable life, being always supplied with what he required. But at last he began to hint at the source of his riches to other people, and henceforth the Ingerswak declined to assist him further. 131. The Removal of Disco Island Off the southernmost part of Greenland an island was situated which some of the inhabitants of the mainland took a dislike to, because it cut them off from the open sea. Two old men got the idea of removing it by help of some magic lay. Their names were Navingasilernak and Nivikfarsuk, but another oldster, called Kiviaritajak, rather inclined to retain the island. The first two went in their kayaks to fasten a hair from the head of a little child to the outside, while the last from shore tried to keep it back by means of a thong of sealskin made fast to it. The two old kayakers then pushed off, chanting their spells and tugging the hair. At length the thong burst, and the island got afloat, and continually singing, they pulled away to the north, and placed it in front of a lulisat. It is now Disco Island. The translation caused the bottom of the sea to rise all along where they traveled. 132. The Amarok Dot, a man who mourned the death of a relative went out in hopes of finding some means of excitement. And being told that an Amarok had been heard roaring in the Firth of Nook, Godthab, he could not be kept from going off to encounter the beast. Accompanied by a relative, he went up the country, and finding the young ones of the Amarok, the mourner instantly killed the whole. But his companion, getting terribly frightened, betook himself to a cave for refuge, accompanied by the mourner. From their retreat the relative soon saw how the old Amarok came running, holding a whole reindeer between its jaws. And having looked in vain for its young ones, it rushed down to the lake, where it appeared to be hauling out something of a human shape. At the same moment, turning round to his companion, he saw him falling helpless to the ground. The Amarok, from which nothing remains concealed, had discovered him and taken the soul out of his body. 133. An old bachelor, being a very successful hunter, was always worried by his place fellows about taking to himself a wife. At last he consented, but when about to make a choice, none of the women at the place appeared good enough for him. Starting in his boat for the neighboring hamlet, he declared he was going to fetch the only sister of some men living there. On his way thither he met with another kayaker, and addressed him, Art not thou one of the many brothers? Yes, I am the middle one of them. I come to demand thy only sister in marriage, and if I may have her I will give thee my boat and a new tent. We will allow no one to get her, because she is the only woman in our house. Having got this information the old bachelor instantly made about, went home, and gave up all thoughts of marrying. Being once in his kayak, and suffering from thirst, he observed a small stream of water running down a rock. Remaining in his kayak, he merely turned his face upwards, so as to let the water run into his open mouth. When his thirst had been quenched, and he wanted to push off, his mouth clung to the rock, being at the same time gradually prolonged, because the tide was falling, and thus he had to remain hanging until the next tide should float him off again. 
Note. A number of stories are found ridiculing bachelors, and all more or less trifling, like this one. Generally their passions are represented as being excited at the sight of a fine woman. But on approaching her, and perhaps even getting hold of her, she proves to be a gull, or perhaps a stone. Others will marry none but a dwarf, or a woman without breasts. One of them out of a piece of ice makes a little island to live upon by himself. 134. A girl named Iserfik preferred animals to men. Lastly, she fell in love with an eagle, that carried her off further inland. A man went after them to fetch her back, but she excited the eagle against him. The man sought refuge beneath a stone. The eagle began to peck at it with its beak to make a hole in it. But the man sent out his amulet, killed the eagle, and carried Iserfik back to her home, where she gave birth to a child, half man, half eagle. Finally, she lost her mind and died. 135. The Sunrise A man from the east coast of Greenland from love for his home never left it even during the summertime, and among his principal enjoyments was that of gazing at the sun rising out of the ocean. But when his son grew up he became desirous of seeing other countries, and, above all, accompanying his countrymen to the west coast. At length he persuaded his father to go with him. No sooner, however, had he passed Cape Farewell, and saw the sun about to rise behind the land, than he insisted upon returning immediately. Having again reached their home island, he went out from his tent early next morning, and when his people had in vain waited for his return, they went out and found him dead. His delight at again seeing the sunrise had overpowered and killed him. 136. The Arnarquixac. An Angakok performed a conjuration in order to procure good seal hunting. He went down to the old hag, the Arnarquixac, at the bottom of the sea, and found her in a great rage. Having entered her abode, she seized hold of her hair behind one ear, grasping some bloody clothes, and afterwards from behind the other one she fetched down a crying baby, flinging both upon the floor. The Angakok then succeeded in propitiating her. 137. Sogak had a quarrel with his brother and fled. He came to a house of such length that a man could wear out the soles of his boots wandering from one end to the other. The master of the house had a crowd of daughters, and an immense stock of provisions. He ordered meat to be served up for Sogak, and forced him to eat. When Sogak declared that he was satiated, his host went on to point his knife at his eyes, saying that as long as he could twinkle them he could also eat. When he finally left off twinkling they served up dried human flesh before him. 138. The bloody rock dot, at a certain wintering place all the men successively disappeared on going out. Two young lads who were still left, while roaming about came to a mountain continually turning round, and on one side all bloody. One youth tried the bloody path, but fell down and perished. The other waited till the bloody side turned away from him, and climbing gained the summit, when he found a house, and a man who lived by hunting eider ducks in a lake. After having stayed some time, and rendered assistance to this man, he returned home safely. 139. Isigarsagak and his sister were frightened from home by the Angakok tricks of their mother, and fled to the south, traveling on for three years in order to reach the end, of the land. Meanwhile, Isigarsagak perceived his stomach to swell up, so as to make him unfit for kayaking. In crossing a frozen firth, he once saw two ravens coming from the interior. Which as they came nearer looked like women hurrying towards the sea, and having caught two seals, they took them on their shoulders and hastened back to the inland. Guided by them, Isigarsagak came to a house. Where an old woman offered to cure his stomach. She then examined him by head lifting, and found out that on leaving his mother he had forgotten some hunting bladders. Cutting open his stomach she brought forth the bladders. Which would otherwise have made him burst, she said, if they had been allowed to remain much longer. At that instant a woman appeared at the entrance, armed with a knife, and they warned him to make haste if he would escape her. Because it was she who had killed the men of the house. Having returned safely to his sister. He took a fancy to trace the passage of the birds in autumn. He traveled in his kayak until the sky became so low that he could reach it with his paddle oar. 
It had two large holes, beyond which he discovered a sea, and was obliged to turn back. 140. A woman named Arna Sugausak, on being scolded by her parents for having broken her mother's precious needle, fled with her daughter to the inland, where they lived with people, who after a while were transformed into partridges. And afterwards with others who changed into reindeers. Finally, they returned to the sea coast, and saw some men flensing a whale. While standing calling out to them they were converted into stones. 141, A Tale from East Greenland Two cousins loved each other, but one of them having a passion for outdoing other people, grew irritated at seeing the other not only getting first married, but also having the first son. And that one catching seals before his own son had got a bird. He then removed to another place, and his son trained a dog to tear men to pieces, by feeding it with food that had been in contact with human bones. It had already devoured several travelers when the cousin and his son came and attacked the dangerous animal, and killed it between them. 142, Another Tale from East Greenland A widow and her son were despised by their housemates, and suffered want of food. At last she died, and the child, named Kongajuk, being very sick, was left alone in the house. There it heard the bones of the graves rattling, and in came its mother, leading another child in her hand, and afterwards its father, accompanied by other deceased people, who took Kongajuk along with them to their abodes. 143. The Swimmer, a tale from Labrador. A mother, who lived at a solitary place, successively lost all her children, who were killed by enemies. Finally, she got a son, whom from his babyhood she brought up with the aim of making him fit for dwelling in the water like a seal. The enemies once went to the place with the intention of killing him also. But the mother, seeing the kayaker's approach, told him to make his escape through the water. The enemies, who observed him jumping into the water, had no doubt they would get hold of him. But, swimming like a seal, he seduced them far out to sea, when the mother whipped the surface of the water with a string, causing a storm, by which they all perished, her son being the only one saved. Note. From East Greenland there is a somewhat similar tale about a man having three sons, who would not grow properly, and were brought up as swimmers. 144. The natives of Labrador tell how our ancestors and the Tunnex, or Tunnet, in Greenlandish Tornit, plural of Tun, in days of yore lived together. But the Tunnex fled from fear of our people, who used to drill holes in their foreheads while yet alive. With this view they removed from here to the north, crossing over to Killinek, Cape Chudley. While dwelling among us they had sealskins with the blubber attached for bedrobes. Their clothes were made in the same way. Their weapons were formed of slate and horn stone, and their drills of crystal. They were strong and formidable, especially one of them, called by the name of Joranat, from which is formed Javianarpak, Greenlandish, Navianarpo. Huge blocks of stone are still to be seen which they were able to move. Some ruins of their houses are also to be found here and there in our country, chiefly upon the islands, having been built of stones, and differing from the abodes of our people. One of our ancestors when kayaking had a tunnock for his companion, who had a bird spear, the points of which were made of walrus tooth. Note. This tradition is compiled from several manuscripts in German from the missionaries in Labrador, in which the alien nation, expelled by the present inhabitants, are called partly Die Tunnet and partly Die Gronlander. Very probably these denominations have arisen from a misunderstanding, induced by inquiries put to the natives as to their knowing anything about the Greenlanders. The Tunnet are almost certainly identical with the Tornet or Inlanders of the Greenland Tales. The Eskimo of Cumberland Inlet speak about the Tunnadlermiet, which signifies people living in the inland. The present Indians of Labrador are called by the Eskimo of the same country Aulik, but it is possible they distinguish between these and the traditional or fabulous inlanders. However, the most striking incongruity is that of the Tunnet having had their abodes on the islands, which looks as if ancient settlers of European race are hinted at. Be this as it may, the tradition of the Labradorans should be more closely examined. 145. The Shark as Provider a mother with her daughter being abandoned by their relatives, and helpless, 
were saved from starvation by a dead seal which drifted to the shore. After a time they found another, and a shark appeared to them, rising out of the sea, and saying that now he would supply all their wants. He took up his abode with them. And afterwards, when some Inuritlagaks were approaching, he took the two women on his back, along with all their implements, and brought them away to an island. 146. A woman named Alakakukiak had been allied to her enemies by the bands of marriage. A poor old wife, to whom she had shown much kindness, once informed her of her brother's-in-law intending to kill her. On hearing this she fled to the inland, where she first met with a bear. Having no sort of weapon whatever, she took a string from her hood, and cracking it like a whip in the front of the animal, she made it fall to the ground. She proceeded in the same manner with an amarok, and at length she reached the sea on the other side, and came to her relatives. Note dot, a very similar, but equally trifling and insignificant fragment, has been received from Labrador. 147. The ocean spider dot, a kayaker in the Firth of Godthab once, at a place where no shoal was known to exist, saw the bottom quite close to him. He then suddenly recollected to have heard old people talking of the ocean spider, a most dangerous animal to the kayakers. Presently he discovered a monstrous eye, and at the distance of about a kayak paddle's length from it a similar one, and on tearing away from the spot a terrible gap made its appearance. Indeed, if he had been a less skilled kayaker, he would never have got off alive. 148. A woman who was mated with a dog got ten children. When they had grown larger, she ordered them to devour her father, whereupon she divided them into two parties and sent them off from home to seek their subsistence henceforth by themselves. Five of them, who were sent up the country, grew Urkelex. And to the other five she gave the sole of an old boot, and put it in the sea, where it rapidly expanded and grew a ship, in which they went off, turning into Kavlunax, Europeans. 149. Katagags had no faith in the Angakut, and sometimes, when attending their conjurations, he tore away the window curtain, and thereby dispelled all their doings. But once when an Angakok had begun his conjuration, and announced his tornak to be approaching in the shape of a fire, Katagags tore away the curtain which covered the entrance, and ran outside. Suddenly he discovered a great flame rushing through the air, which struck him with terror, and made him re-enter the house, and trembling from head to foot cling to the rafters of the hut, from whence fatigue soon made him fall to the ground. When the conjuration had been finished, and the fire kept off, Katagax was missed. At length they brought him forth from underneath the ledge, all covered with filth, in which state he left the house, never to attend Angakok service any more. 150. Ordlavarsik despised the Angakut, and never used to attend their conjurations. But once spending an evening at another place, in a house where an Angakok went on performing his art, he became so fond of the women's song, that suddenly he took a fancy to become an Angakok himself. Imitating the Angakut's fashion, he betook himself to lonely places, and called for a tornak. At length a giant-like man appeared, armed with a long staff, with which he would touch him. But Ordlavarsik got terrified, and turning round to the beach walked through some shallow water to an island, whither the demon was unable to follow him. The Tornak having in vain offered himself to his disposal, turned back and disappeared. Ordlavarsik then repenting his foolishness, called out for him again, but received no answer, and never more succeeded in calling forth a Tornak. 